Grace of um, His Grace, His Holiness, Giriraj Maharaj. Um, the personal uh, aspect of Krishna consciousness in uh, keeping it personal, um, as we're all spirit souls, we would like to extend that to all of you. And if you are all comfortable, um, we would ask you to turn on your cameras to make it more personal and also for your active participation in today's uh, class. Um, so with that, um, we would like to ask the blessings of all the Vaishnavas. Um, the, in, in, in India, when we start to do any, uh, anything, if we start to start anything, we ask for the prayers of Lord Ganesha. We say, Om Ganeshaya Namaha. So in that spirit, um, Lord Ganesha, he removes all the obstacles on the path of progress. But even Lord Ganesha, he gets his power from Lord Krishna. In Brahma Samhita, it says, Yad pada pallava yugam vinidhaya kumba, vanve pranama samaya saganadi raja. Lord Ganesha gets all his power from the lotus feet of Lord Krishna, which he places on his head. So in that uh, mood, we would like to pray to all of the assembled Vaishnavas, including all of you present here, uh, for the power to speak something uh, that may uh, help and inspire all of you. So, we get started? Ho Magnyan Timirandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya. Everyone can please join in. Chakshurun Muditam Yena Tasmai Shri Kuruve Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Pishtam Stapitam Yena Tadati Sva Padam Pikam Pandeham Shri Kuru Shri Yuta Patakamalam Shri Kuru Vaishnavamsha Shri Rupam Sakrajata Satanam Tam Sajivam Satvaitam Savatutam Parijana Sajitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Pata Sahagana Sajitam Shakan Vitamscha Namom Vishnu Padai Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale Shrimate Bhakti Vedan Swami Niti Namine Namaste Saraswati Teve Kauravani Pracharine Nirvisheshanyamadi Paschatya De Shitarine Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityanam Shri Advaita Padathar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Brinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So Today, you know, this is an overview that uh, uh, should be. Work or no? Haribo. What? Sushil so, Prabhu, you have a comment or a question? Oh, I think the mic must have accidentally turned on. Sorry about that. So, today, the topics to give you an overview of what we're going to cover is, as Surbhi said, who am I? You know, am I a carbon form? Am I God? Nowadays, there's a new theory that says robotic. You know, we are just an AI simulation, you know, consciousness, super consciousness. So that's the core subject that we will be talking about. And then we go through, you know, to understand the soul. We also need to understand the body. You know, what is life? What is death? And then finally, we look at it from a aspect of, in a very clinical manner, you know, is this just sentiment? Is this just philosophy? Or is it something actuality? So fact versus fiction, truth versus perception. Some of these you will find had already been covered so well by Madhupati Prabhu and Krishna Anand Prabhu uh, yesterday. So there may be a bit of repetition, but please bear in the sense that whatever gets repeated gets ingrained. So in a way, it's it's good. And then finally, my skills. It is the knowledge that we get, okay? How we could apply it in our day-to-day -day lives. Otherwise, knowledge without application is just used as information which is fluttering our minds. But when we take that knowledge and we put it into practice, it becomes realizations which go in much deeper. And especially significant of this particular topic today, the uh, 
uh, soul has a very special and deep personal connection for me personally. I'll give you a small story very quickly. When I had gone down south to do my engineering and uh, just before my 20th birthday, on the night before my 20th birthday, I don't know why, I just got a strong feeling that I'm going to die. And for a 19, 20 year old kid to get that feeling, and it was real, uh, I started panicking, sitting you know, hundreds and thousands of miles away from home. Uh, didn't know what to do. So sitting alone in my dorm, in my uh, room, with my uh, roommate, he, had, he was fast asleep. So in the middle of the night, maybe around one or two, I woke up. And when I had gone to college, my mom had packed a Bhagavad Gita with me, but it just remained on the bookshelf. I never opened it for about two semesters. And then when this happened, you know, I just was drawn to it. I opened it and I opened it at random. And I came to page uh, chapter two, where it says that, you know, you're the soul. Soul can never die. It, wind cannot dry. It. You know, all these things we'll see as we go through the uh, slide presentation. And that brought so much of relief, so much of relief. So whatever was that anxiety, just reading and getting, you know, I still did not understand what it is. Much later, we understood it. So that's what we're going to cover, the idea of what is soul, the fact of what is soul. And then finally, we'll get into question answers. But as Surbhi said, you know, if you would be kind enough to open your cameras, don't feel shy. There's no judgment, no nothing. It's like Giriraj Maharaj says, our entire philosophy is based on a personal relationship with ourselves, with humans, living entities, and with Krishna, the creator of everyone. So this makes it more personal, more engaging. And this presentation that Surbhi and I are going to put forward uh, for your uh, review is going to be something which is very interactive. So though question answers comes at the bottom, there'll be QAs throughout. If you have a question, you know, please uh, ask it as and when, or if you have a comment or so. Now here, over to you, Surbhi. Okay. So, um, uh, give me a second. I think. Sorry, that was a little. So, so first thing we need to do is the knowledge mechanisms. You know, what are the knowledge mechanisms? Uh, there are branches of knowledge. Okay. So the systematic study of the natural phenomenon is called science. So the word is systematic study. Now, if you look at science, there are two main branches. One is the material sciences and the other is the spiritual sciences. What does material science talk about? It deals mainly with physics. Physics, they say, is the mother of all science. Physics is underlying, which is present in chemistry, which is present in the biology, which is present in electronics. Physics is there even at the uh, quantum subparticle level is there at the macro level. So physics is the underlying uh, layer. They call it the mother of all science. And what does material science deal with? And there is the metaphysics that is about the physics, correct? So there's physics and there is something which is outside the physics called metaphysics, the spiritual sciences. So physics mainly deals with matter and energy and the interactions of these two. That's all it comes down to. So if you deconstruct science, it comes down to how matter, what is matter, what is energy, and how they behave with each other. Similarly, metaphysics is also similar. It deals with spirit and the energetic. Please keep this word in your mind, energetic. So that is what uh, uh, the uh, spiritual sciences are about. In fact, spiritual science also includes about matter and energy. So if you have the chance to read the Bhagavatam, it will also talk about uh, matter and energy in great detail, as well as the spirit and the energetic. Okay, so how do we know what we know? All of us know stuff. Literally, any person you meet, literally, any person you meet knows something you have no clue about. It could be a beggar on the road. It could be uh, somebody like Einstein who has several PhDs, doesn't matter. It could be a small little child. Whoever it be knows something that we do not know. So how do we know what we know? Okay, there are two main areas. One is curiosity. You know, human being, our intellect is by nature curious. We like to see things and figure out why is it like this, why is it like that? The most, this can be seen in children. 
children are so curious, children are so uh, inquisitive in a very positive way. Curiosity is the necessity of creativity. So first is curiosity aspect, and the other is the necessity. Necessity, they say, is the mother of invention. So whatever we can see day to day that we use, whether it's a pen, whether it's a spoon, anything, which we just take it for granted, you know, every little thing, the button on your kurta, everything, there was a necessity and then something came out of it. So what we know, what we know is, how we know what we know is through curiosity and necessity. These two aspects. Now, yesterday, uh, Madhupati Prabhu and Krishnana Manan Prabhus, uh, they covered this very well. So then there are the different manners in which we go about seeking knowledge. One is through sense perception. See stuff. I hear stuff. I feel stuff, I can taste stuff, and that's how I get some idea about it. And then I'll do further inquiries, correct? So there is that sense perception. The other is through intellectual reference, like I already have some experiences stored in my mind, and then I make some kind of, oh, you know, so this thing looks like a duck, walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, therefore it must be a duck. So that is the intellectual reference because we already know what a duck looks like, talks, walks like, and quacks like. So we say, okay, so we try and make that connection. Then the other one is from an authoritative source. Okay, we will study this in little detail. So in Sanskrit, they call this Pratyaksha Pramana. In the intellectual inference, they call it the Anuman Praman, and the authoritative is the Shabda Praman. Shabda, most of us are from the Indian subcontinent, so we would be familiar with this word Shabda. Shabda means the word, word. In fact, there is a faith called Sikhism. In Sikhism, the Shabda, they take Shabda as the Guru. They have the Guru Granth Sahib, it's a book. The deity is a book. Correct. It is filled with Ram, Krishna, Gopal, Hari, Ram, Krishna, Gopal, Hari. Every page, every paragraph, these names will be repeated over and over and over again. Okay, there's a very nice pastime of uh, Lord Guru Nanak and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu meeting in Puri. So Shabda, Shabda is the word and that word is coming from the authority, the authoritative word. Okay, so with this... Surbi, you will have to take the next slide. Sorry, I got a little mixed up with uh, this should have come later. So as we mentioned, and as Madhupati Prabhuji and uh, uh, Krishna, Kosa, uh, Krishna Namanan Prabhuji mentioned so beautifully uh, yesterday, there are different ways of acquiring knowledge. There is Pratyaksha Praman, there's Anuman Praman, and there is Shabda Praman. So, uh, today, we have a small interactive workshop where we'll just explore these different um, different types of praman. So there is an optical illusion um, the, on the left of your screen. There is a there is um, an old woman in this screen in this picture, but there's also a young woman in this picture. Uh, you can spot it. the The young woman uh, is the the young woman has her uh, collarbone around her neck and then the the older woman has a long pointy neck so you can see in this picture the artist has made it so that there is both a young woman and an old woman in this picture but our eyes our eyes are only able to capture one or two at one, one at one time um so this is one uh, optical illusion uh, i'll take you give you a few seconds to uh, try to find the old and young woman are you able to move the money back to your credit card account? Not credit card account, your bank account. It has to be direct bank account? Haribo, uh, Pritesh, Pritesh, you could direct it here to our <laughs> book distribution. <laughs> sure, <laughs> sure, sure. So here uh, on the right, we have a cup. And we also have two people facing each other at the same time. So in the white, you will see a cup but also in the black, there are two people facing each other. So there are two different pictures in this, uh, in this optical illusion. Um, so this is another, uh, show, this also shows that our senses, our eyes are unable to see both realities at the same time. We also have a picture of a, um, a glass of water. And often when you will put like a pencil inside a glass of water, you'll see that the pencil 
it will bend in the light. So that also shows that our senses are not perfect in uh, figuring out the uh, figuring out everyday reality. Now, this is an, these are examples of pratyaksha praman. So for anuman praman, anuman praman is knowledge based on evidence. It is they, it's, it's like a guessing game. So here we have so many assembled devotees behind their black screens. If I were to guess, oh, what is, uh, what is uh, Deepak Goyal Prabhuji doing? What is Subal Prabhuji doing? What is Damodar Vilas Prabhuji doing? I'll have to guess, oh, it is dinner time. Maybe they're eating dinner with their family, so they're not able to turn on their uh, cameras. I'll have to guess, so Radha Prem Pradamataji, she has two daughters, so she must be very busy uh, cooking for them and taking care of Ishani. So I'm, I have to guess, but there's no real specific um, answer, no guaranteed answer to my question. Another example of Anuman Praman uh, is someone speaking a different language than you. I, uh, this is an example of Japanese, but I speak Oriya. And if uh, I spoke Oriya to uh, one of you and you, you guys did not know Oriya, you all did not know Oriya, then you would not understand what I was saying. So I could, I could maybe try that. Uh, do, are there any volunteers in the audience uh, that I could, that could, that could help me show Anuman Praman right now? Anyone who would like to uh, join us? It will just be a small interactive. You can unmute. I can do something what you want to do if you tell me what you want to do then. <laughs> Okay, um, I am going to talk a little bit uh, in Oriya with you, and I will. I hope that you can understand what I'm saying. Oh, <laughs> that's fine. Thank you. Um, Wait one second. I, I got. I have to turn off something here. One second. Okay. Say again. Oh, it's great. Very good. Thank you. So. Uh, okay. So. We, We'll get started. So, mu aji gute the banana gute khau thili. Ah, banana the both tasty achi. Ah, mu tikke pare mu dinner khai bi. Mama sangre. Ah, mama aji both bhala khai ba bani chhi. Ah, ah. Do you understand anything I said, Mataji? Little bit I understood, and little bit I I could figure out. So, <laughs> what what did you understand I said, Mataji? So, um, uh, you said that I'm dinner and I'm having banana um, something with banana in the dinner <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah yeah perfect I said something like um, I'm eating a banana today my mom is making dinner and I'll have dinner later so you Mataji I was saying that you were guessing what I was saying based on the small words like banana dinner mama right. small right. things like that you were guessing so that the same thing the same spirit is there in Anuman Praman Anuman Praman is basically, we are, someone is speaking a different language. Spiritual knowledge is like a different language for us. And we are basically just trying to guess what is happening. Unless we speak the language of Krishna consciousness or the language of spiritual realization, with our material devices, we won't be able to understand spiritual knowledge. So that is, that is Anuman, the definition of Anuman Praman. So we can see that... Um, even with our material senses, our all of this evidence, even this is not trustworthy in answering simple questions like um, this, uh, what is going on in this picture? What am I saying in my language? If they are not perfect in understanding simple exercise in everyday life. So what to speak about the biggest question, who am I? So we must learn from someone who is free from defects as was explained yesterday in the class. Um, and who is that person? Uh, that person, Amrita Nand Prabhuji, will explain later. Over to you, Prabhuji. Thank you, Surabhi. Very nicely done. Now, I'm sorry, this slide should come actually before the one with Surabhi uh, took up. And I messed up a little bit, but that just shows I'm human. Imperfect. So here we have who I am, and let's understand who I am based on the perception and inference model. Okay. So first thing what we understand is there is matter okay things we look around us is matter matter is a very simple uh, way to understand this matter is something which is not conscious 
whatever be the form, it could be in gaseous form, it could be in plasma, it could be solid, it could be uh, liquid and in between, whatever it is. But that is what is matter. Matter is something which is inert, it is not conscious. So how did all this come about, Shrishti? How did all the creation come about based on the perception and the infer inference model, okay? By chance, luck. Just as if someone goes and plays mega ball, you know, the odds are one in some millions or something of winning it. It's a chance, correct? So what they say is initially there was a big bang. Big bang is nothing but infinite mass in a point of singularity in such a small little place, space, which is there. And then it just exploded and then there was this rapid acceleration then they say there were these particles the fundamental particles the fundamental particles which make up particles so you know atoms atoms are made up of electrons there's a nucleus there's a proton but there are stuff which makes these protons and uh, electron electron is a fundamental particle so there are smaller particles which they're discovering new and new in the uh, uh, quantum world correct so for every particle matter there is an antimatter and it cancels itself out it cancels itself out but somehow or the other something happened that the matter okay they were more in population so to say and that's how all this creation came about and because once these particles came we had the physics from physics came chemistry from chemistry came biology then all this thing was formed there were the amino acids there was the primordial soup and over a period of time it got together and that's how somehow it became inert matter became conscious and as we said earlier consciousness is nothing but life so this is the uh, explanation of how life came into being and over time okay with a lot of time they say the big bang happened about 14 billion years 13 point something say 14 billion years ago then with the time okay things started evolving they got together and then single cell became uh, double cell and they got more and more complex and somehow or the other through the theory of evolution, okay, beaver came, human being came, okay. And then they say the human beings there is starting from a certain yesterday, Madhupati Prabhu's slide, you saw that, you know, there were these, uh, the missing links, we came from the monkeys. And uh, I mean, there is enough evidence to have uh, falsified all these theories which happened. So this is how, according to the inference perception model, Currently, what we have is how life came about. Okay, but the fundamental thing is that there's a problem in the uh, perception and the inference, pratyaksha and the uh, anuman praman. You know, it's a basic, uh, it's a limitation, you can say. It's a limitation. So if at the start of your equation, there's some, there's some problem, you know, no matter how elaborate it comes at the end, it will be a problem. So this is how human beings came. And then, you know, what next? After human, what will we evolve into? Will we become something like that uh, Terminator, Arnold Schwarzenegger, where you have a uh, carbon-formed skin, but inside it is all machine? What's next? You know, these are all like science fiction. Is that what we are going towards? Okay. Can life be created in a lab? You know, recently they had done, recently, maybe about a year ago, uh, they were able to replicate a DNA strand in the laboratory, you know, with manipulating chemicals, amino acids, and this and that, so and so forth. They were able to do that, but is it conscious? Where is the consciousness coming from? So that's what is the current, uh, uh, you know, so how it started. Now, how it is going is if you see this, there is consciousness, mind, and body. And here again, I will request any one volunteer. The question is, which gear is changing what? Is body controlling the mind and consciousness and turning it according to its will? Is mind turning the body or consciousness? Or is consciousness turning the body and mind? What do you think? Anybody? There's no right or wrong answer. So don't uh, worry that, oh, I may give a wrong answer and I'll look silly. Conscious. Yes. 
consciousness dear govind prabhu hari bol my pranam to you uh, consciousness is moving mind and body then how do we explain that there is something called muscle memory that you don't even think about it and especially uh, soldiers who go into battle they are trained that if there is a particular stimuli they just react there's no time to think also they just react so the body does something and then later on it processes actually the answer is right dear govan prabhu what you said consciousness provided the consciousness takes control otherwise it is the body or the mind which can move the consciousness here and there it will go here it will go there that's why you know one very important instruction which shri prabhupad gave us if you're not feeling enthusiastic act enthusiastic you will become enthusiastic so for japa you have to get up in the morning oh my god i don't feel like getting up some of the other just jump out of bed go and have your shower then automatically you'll feel enthusiastic and this is applicable even to our day to day life or anything else you know tomorrow is monday morning and everyone who is working gets the monday morning blues oh my god i have to go to work but just by changing that perspective instead of saying i have to go to work say i get to go to work have becomes a compulsion get becomes an opportunity that whole mindset will change that's how we are training the mind so this is what the perception model is surbi could you talk a little bit more about this comes uh, sorry my slides were a little front and back so looking at that who am i we go to the source model now in the source model okay what we had discussed earlier it's coming from an authoritative source correct now what does the source model mean it is truth which is coming directly as it is from the source of all truths factual okay that source you know a very popular and a common word is bhagavan right now this was explained yesterday the four material defects and all but when we're talking about this source has no defect it is defect free okay and that source okay assimilates everything into scriptures this was explained yesterday if you remember from the scriptures there are these learned scholars we call them sadhus okay the ones who have realized it's not knowledge but realization of the facts and then there are gurus they also are persons who have realized it and they are the ones who are now teaching you me and you know the general uh, humanity so this is how we understand that this is the bhagwan from the source itself it comes assimilated into the shastras then there are the sadhus and then there are the gurus so guru sadhu shastra the trifecta of understanding what are facts now if we need to understand who i am it is also necessary to understand that source the energetic if you remember we spoke about energy and the energetic so there is the source the energetic source correct the bhagavan bhagavan is nothing but full of six opulences which was covered yesterday you know wealth strength beauty fame renunciation uh, knowledge so in totality so that source also known as krishna there is the source now we are talking about energy and the energetic there is a source and he has the internal energy correct the internal energy and now this internal energy is called spiritual when we talk about spirit spiritual is nothing but referring to the internal energy of the energetic then there is what we call the marginal energy who you and i and every living entity including the cat dog elephant insect amoeba bacteria we are the marginal energy and from this marginal energy there is the third type of an energy which is called the external energy this external energy is matter now the inner two rings that you see is conscious the outer ring which is gray shaded is unconscious in the sense that it is inert it is dull matter 
it has no consciousness consciousness is superior to matter simply because with consciousness things can be done matter is nothing but things can be done to it it can't do things on its own so naturally where you have the ability to do things is greater than something which just is remains things can only be done to it if i want to move this glass on the table the glass can't move on its own but i have need to push it or i need to pick it and take a sip or whatever else it is so this is what the first basic understanding is who i am is that i am energy i am the marginal energy of the energetic and that energetic also has two other types of energies one is the internal energy and the other is the material energy so surbi if you can share your thoughts on the shabda praman all right so as amrita and pradeep so beautifully discussed the how shabda praman or learning from someone who has all the knowledge um without any defect they are the most powerful in giving us knowledge because they truly know while we do not know as well because we have some imperfect senses so who better to give us knowledge than one who is free from all defects and who is that person that person is krishna or god um and so when 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 that knowledge is transferred over time to us then that without addition or subtraction that knowledge is purely uh pure, it's it's totally pure so to understand the amazing the amazing power and perfection of shabda praman um i would like to do an exercise with all of you so if i can have one volunteer from the audience um hopefully someone new if someone new can uh join us i would request you to turn on your camera and we'll just have a small uh exercise together if no one is uh, volunteering i'll have to call on someone <laughs> amrita nandan prabhuji would you like to be my volunteer sure as you wish all right so today um uh, i'm what i what the plan is i will close my uh video camera right now and i will ask you if you can hear me and if you can see me and i'll be telling you a small description a small description of uh, uh something and uh please let me know if you can hear me and if i'm coming closer to you all right okay, okay. let's get started some sound can we hum humbly request everybody else to mute their uh, lines hari ram 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 hari 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 krishna can you hear me can you hear yeah me? i can hear i can hear you hari krishna 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 hari 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 ram ram i think you're faintly chanting the maha mantra hari krishna 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 hari 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 ram hari ram 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 hari hari can yeah this is better i can hear you but i can't see you hari krishna hare krishna 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 hari hare hare ram hare ram 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 hare hare yeah you are you are definitely chanting the maha mantra loud and clear but i can't see you at all you still can't see me no hare krishna hare krishna 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 hare hare hari ram hari ram 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 hare hare yeah i can i can see you now and you have lord jagannath <laughs> you're holding up lord jagannath yeah. yeah i see you and i heard you so that is the uh power of shabda praman so shabda praman it is basically we cannot see with our eyes right now right now you cannot see me we cannot see krishna because um because we are blind because we are um in in darkness we're not able to see krishna we don't have the eyes to see krishna krishna says, says in bhagavad gita that he appears to people 
who love him with all all kinds of uh, um, all kinds of devotion. So only to them, Krishna, he appears to them. So in this interaction, Amritananda Prabhuji, you are the eager seeker who is uh, trying to find Krishna. And mm -hmm. Krishna is behind the curtain of ignorance. And right when we open the curtain of ignorance, I am here, Krishna is here. So Krishna says, oh, sorry, Brahma says in Brahma Samhita, Premanjana Chrita Bhakti Vilochanena, I worship Govinda, the primeval Lord, who is Shyama Sundara, Krishna himself, with inconceivable, innumerable attributes, whom the pure devotees see in their hearts, of hearts with the eye of devotion, tinged with the salve of love. So here, Amritanand Prabhuji, after... After a few seconds, for these devotees, few, few lifetimes, um, Krishna finally appears to them. So after some practice of sadhana, sadhana Jagannath appeared in front of their eyes. So that's the power of Shabda Praman. When we are, uh, uh, when we, we, although we are blind, because we hear uh, the Guru Vakya, because we hear over and over again instructions, over time, we get the eyes our eyes are opened up to see Lord Krishna as he truly is. So that is the power of Shabda Praman. It gives eyes to those who don't have eyes. So thank you so much, Amritanand Prabhuji, for being my volunteer and helping. Lovely, lovely me. example. Uh, Though sure. we are blinded by material ignorance, you can still hear the sound. I couldn't see you, but I could hear you. Yes. And that's what is the Shabda Praman. Fantastic. Yes. All right. Over to you, Prabhuji. Very nice, Survi. So, so this is the. Uh, uh, give me a second. So we talked about the energetic, the energy, and creation. Is there anyone brave enough to take a small quiz at this point in time? In five seconds, anybody. Thousand one, thousand two, thousand three, thousand four. 2005. Okay, nobody. Uh, very good. Uh, so we talk about the energetic and the energy. So how many energies does uh, the energetic have? How many energy energetic have? Yes, sir. The slide, if you remember before, the concentric Four. circles. Force. Four is kind of right, but actually three, there is the energetic, there's the internal energy, which is spiritual, and then there is the external energy, a marginal energy, which is the jiva, and then there's the external energy, which is the uh, material energy. So yes. Wow. And Krishna himself is the source of that energy. He's the energetic who possesses all this soul. So thank you for Prabhuji. your participation. So we have the energy and the energetic. Now let us understand how this creation happens. So if you remember a few minutes back, we spoke about Big Bang. That's the perception, Anuman, you know, and how it happened. Now here's factually how Big Bang happened. So Krishna, he has his first expansion known as Mahavishnu. So whatever is the uh, total material energy, you know, there are Sanskrit words, but the concept is pretty simple. It's called the Mahatattva. What it does is all the ingredients necessary for creation is that's what Mahavishnu does, okay? So if you're cooking some, you know, you're making some nice uh, uh, Malai Kofta, so you'll have different ingredients from small to major. You'll have paneer, you'll have tomato puree, you'll have, you know, masalas, you'll have this, you'll have that, you'll have oil. So many little things are there. Then you'll have utensils, you'll have the karchi, you'll have spoon and all that. So all that put together will give a nice creation. You're creating the Malai Kofta. Now, similarly, that whole ingredient, okay, the Mahatattva, is that is what Mahavishnu's responsibility is also known as the Karana Dakshe Vishnu. Karana means the cause. That's what causes the entire. He provides all the ingredients. Then the second expansion is 
Garbhodakshayasi Vishnu. What he does is he enters into each and every universe. So these universes uh, come into being. What we know is only our universe and galaxy, uh, the Milky Way, but there are countless. We still have no estimate. And, you know, we also agree, you know, the material science agrees that there are some universes we will never, ever get to know because it's way beyond the uh, Light is the main medium through which we can detect and understand things and, you know, uh, cosmic radiation, light shifts and all that. That's a little technical, but uh, we will never even know it's beyond our capacity. So like this, there are countless universes, billions and trillions. And incidentally, the material creation, which seemingly seems to be infinite, is just 25% of what actually is the spiritual realm. So the spiritual realm is 75. We still have no capacity to even understand going beyond, you know, the speed of light what had come so we can understand. So that's what Garbhodaksha, he enters each universe and creates variegatedness. You know, the different varieties that we see around us. That's what Garbhodaksha, Vishnu does. And then finally, the third expansion is this is something which is very popular. We know this name, Paramatma, Paramatma, Paramatma. Okay, so Paramatma is the all-pervading aspect. Then in the entire creation, when it's created, this variegatedness, that's where the Paramatma then enters. And that's the uh, chit aspect, the omniscience. Krishna is omniscient. That's the Paramatma aspect, which is even in the atom, there is nothing. There's no time, space anywhere where Krishna isn't present. That's the omnipresence also. So this is the three aspects of how creation is. And then that's what we see so many beautiful things around us. There is so much beauty, even in city life. People think we need to go to the, you know, away from city light, away from these cars and smoke and everything else. Next time, just try the small little exercise. You come across a tree, you know, on the road or in your office or in the parking lot or anywhere. Just go up to the tree and notice the trunk of a tree, the trunk, you know, the outer covering of the tree. Go close and have a look at it. There is so much beauty in that. There's what a lovely pattern. There's what a lovely texture. And trust me on this, maybe if you feel shy, you could do it when no one is around. Hug the tree. If you hug the tree, and I'm not making a political statement or anything like that, you can feel the warmth of the tree. You can feel the smell, the earthy smell of the tree. It will enliven your senses. Now, this is just something ordinary we see every day and we don't even bother about it. We just walk by it. So there is so much beauty that Krishna has created even in the material world. But we just go by it. I'm getting late for work. I have no time to stop and stare. If you go to, I always have this saying, if there is any atheist, I would like to take my atheist friend to... Grand Canyon and make him stand on the south rim and just have a look at the expanse. And it's as though these big, huge rocks and mountains, you know, it's as though Krishna has crumpled it like a piece of paper, totally crumpled it and opened it out. And all these patterns which are there. Incidentally, in Grand Canyon, there is the Brahma peak, there is the Shiva peak, there is the Vishnu peak. I was surprised when that guide was telling us, the Native Americans, you know, their way of thinking and their way of understanding things around them is very close to the Vedic tradition. Very, very close, very similar. So there is this beauty that we need to be aware of, have be conscious of things and not just be doing mechanical. So, Surbi, if you could uh, talk a little bit more on the three expansions, please. Of course. So just to see if everyone is uh, paying attention to the slide previously, uh, we would like to open it up. Uh, there are three pictures given here on these slides. Um, and these are the three expansions of uh, uh, Lord Krishna. When he, um, in the first uh, picture, he is expanding the material creation. He's glancing on the material creation and creating all of this. Does anyone know what this expansion of Lord Vishnu is called?
Does anyone remember? Karana Dakshay Vishnu. Haribo. Thank you, Mataji. It is Karana Dakshay Vishnu. Karana Dakshay Vishnu is um, another name for Mahavishnu. When he glances over the material creation, so many universes are created. Now, there is a second picture uh, on the side, on the, in the middle. Um, when Lord Vishnu, he enters each, um, each universe. This is the second expansion. Does anyone know what this second picture is referring to? Garbhodakshai Vishnu. Haribo Thaya Mataji. Thank you so much. It's Garbhodakshai Vishnu. Uh, Garba means womb. So Krishna enters the womb of each universe and he expands that way. Um, and finally, on the right, there is another picture of Krishna expanding into each and every um, uh, par uh, Paramatma within, as Paramatma within all of us, as the super soul, he expands into each of us, the germ on my desks or uh, the little fly that flies around. He's inside each and every one of them. Uh, does anyone know who that would be? Shiro Dakshai Vishnu. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Susan Mataji. So, uh, the the third one is Shiro Dakshai Vishnu. Shiro Dakshai Vishnu is um, when Lord Vishnu comes as Paramatma and is sitting in our heart. And back to what Prabhuji was uh, talking about, the, the very question, who am I? It must have some intelligence behind it. The very question that all of us are asking today, who am I? That question has so much intelligence and consciousness behind it. So this intelligence must come from somewhere or someone. So who is that someone? Um, so here we're, we are finding out that the Krishna within us, the Paramatma within us is urging us as the Chaitya Guru. That is the term for the Guru who speaks to us from within. To ask such question, who am I? Do I belong in this material universe? What is my life? And it is from this question every spiritual seeker opens up their um, spiritual path. So um, sometimes we experience there is someone with me. Someone is looking over my shoulder. Someone is with me. I'm not sure if some of you have had that experience, but I've definitely had that experience when I'm doing a test and I'm not understanding a question. I feel Krishna is with me. It'll be okay. Or when I'm, when I'm really scared, I feel, I feel, oh, Krishna is with me. Everything will be okay. And so that feeling, that paramatma within us, is also a proof of uh, a proof of the consciousness I have, and also that Krishna is within us. So these are the three expansions of Krishna. Um, we can move on now over to you, Prabhuji. So based on the Shabda Praman, let us examine who I am. That's what we're trying to understand today. Who I am. Correct. So first is Krishna. We understood this. He's the energetic source. You know, keep in your mind those concentric rings. The energetic source, the spiritual, correct, energy, the marginal energy, and uh, the uh, external material energy. Surbi, you may want to share with them what you spoke with me this afternoon about the watermelon. It'll just put it, give it a better... Better thing. Um, so, what, I, what Prabhuji was speaking with me yesterday, some, we have often, um, we, have, I, we were talking about how a watermelon has many different parts, and here I'm making a small sketch for all of you. So a watermelon, um, it has the outside part, the green outside part, it has the inner white part, and then it has the red inner juicy part. And then inside, it has these little, little seeds inside. So we can also, what, what we're talking in this model is the different energies of Krishna. So here, these seeds are like Krishna himself. They are the energetic. It is without these seeds, we can't have any watermelons. So these seeds are referred to the energetic. And then the outside, the juicy, beautiful part of the watermelon, which we all love to eat, it's kind of like, the internal energy. It's the rasas, the, um, the, the love, the, uh, the ananda, the satchita ananda. That is represented by Srimati Rajalani. Um, it's that juicy part of the watermelon. 
Then over here in the very middle, there is the Tadasta Sakshakti. Um, it is the marginal, marginal energy of the Lord, the white part of the watermelon. Often it's the little bit of the, it's not bitter like the green part, but it's not sweet like the inner part. So this is where we are right now. So this is us. And then the green part on the outside is the external energy of the Lord. So we can think about this model as we go through uh, learning more about the energies of the Lord that Prabhuji will explain right now. Thank you. Thank that's you. such a, that's so relatable. So next time when we eat a watermelon in summer, we should think about Krishna. Actually, there's so many things that could just remind of, of Krishna. Literally anything and everything can, because everything is his. What is it that is mine when all there is is his? Everything is his, you know, there's nothing. Even we are his, even the material world is his. So great. Thank you, Surbi. That was very nice. So we have Krishna, who's the energetic source. And, uh, you know, there's a word uh, in the Indian word, the Hindi, it's called Shakti Man. Shakti Man is a person who's powerful, the possessor of Shakti. Shakti is energy and Shakti Man is the energetic. So Krishna is Shakti Man in totality. All Shakti comes from him. So he is the, in totality, he is the Shakti Man. Now there is a small little pastime. You know, first we need to understand that energy doesn't exist in a vacuum. It doesn't exist by itself. There is a source and there has to be a possessor of that source. So like we said earlier, that is called Shakti Man. Now, incidentally, those of you who are from the Indian subcontinent, there is also a very famous truck model called Shakti Man. You know, a brand name of the truck, like how we have Ford and Volvo and so on and so forth. There it is called Shakti Man. It is a very sturdy and rugged truck because it can go anywhere and it is mainly used by the Indian military, the Shakti Man truck. A few years ago, there were some skirmishes and there was a war, the Kargil war, Pakistan and India, you know, these border tensions and all that. So after everything was settled and it's back to peace, uh, the Pakistan government gave a huge contract to Tata Motors for several thousands of crores to purchase Shakti Man for their military and so on and so forth. But the chairman of Tata company, uh, Mr. Ratan Tata, uh, he says, no, I'm not going to send my Shakti Man across the border because of whatever had been the here. So if I reflected on that is here, correct? Chairman Tata could stop Shakti Man from going across the border. But Krishna, the original Shakti Man, he is everywhere. No one can stop him from coming or going. As he wills, as he pleases. So if some of you have been in the Bhakti uh, Bhagavad uh, Gita classes, you know his pastimes. He arrives by his will, he winds up his pastime, he goes by his will. That's what it is. We can't question Krishna why. No one can ask that question why. Of course, on another level, there are his devotees and the pure devotees. But this is what that Shakti Man means, that total control or absolute control. Now, there are these again, you know, to get a little bit more detail, the superior energy is the uh, two forms and there is the inferior energy. It's not conscious alert. We've covered this. Then it is known as the internal energy, the spiritual energy has these two parts, mainly Antaranga and Tatastha. Meaning to say is, even though we are marginal, we are still a spiritual entity. Please understand this fundamental very clearly. We are not inferior material energy, simply because we are conscious. So we belong to the superior spiritual energy. That's what our position is. We are spiritual entities, correct? And it's known, the Apar Shakti is known as the Bahiranga. Bahir means back outside, outside the body external energy Hello. is the antaranga the internal has three main categories the sandhani which is the on energy the eternality it's forever okay it's also known as sat the sun with this is embodied by lord uh, balaram sandhani 
Okay, so Sandhani is also has a personality, and that is Lord Balaram. Some with the chit. We spoke earlier, you know, Paramatma and everywhere. The chit, which is knowledge, the omniscience, that is Krishna himself is embodied as the chit. And then finally, we have the ladhani. Ladhani is the one which gives the bliss. Okay, that's that shakti. And that is embodied by Radharani. So the tatast shakti, which uh, Surbi just mentioned earlier, is the marginal energy. Spiritual, albeit, but marginal. It's a marginal energy and spiritual. That's who I am. I am Jiva. The living entity, we call it the spirit in English. You can call it Jiva. It's also known as Atma. Okay. Then also some people will say soul, the soul. Now, whenever we talk about soul, there is common usage of the word soul, like, oh, soul food, soul music. He's a very soulful person. When you actually deconstruct it and go from the soul, it means it's something which is very fundamental, deep, really, really deep, not surface level, fundamental. So we can get an understanding that here we have this body, male, female, whatever be that covering. The fundamental deep, you go, you know, get all the layers out. And that's what it is. I am the Jiva. So Surbi, you want to take this? Yes. Thank you, Prabhuji, for that wonderful description of the different energies of Krishna. And um, leading on this conversation of the external and internal energies and us being the marginal energy of Krishna, but we are not the external dead energy of Krishna, the matter energy of Krishna. So here in this picture, um, it's beautifully shown, depicted uh, all the energies of Krishna, um, the, the, energy, the energies of Krishna, the, mater the material and the Tatasta Shakti is shown in this picture. Here we see um, the different, uh, the different uh, elements, Bhumi, Appa, Analavayu, Kammana, Buddhire, Vacha. So these are the elements um, earth, water, air, fire, ether, that make up the uh, material elements and they make up the material body. But those, that is the form of the body. The body, we can think about it, the body is like a machine. When, when we turn on a machine, the machine starts. But unless the machine is turned on by someone, then it won't, then it won't start, it's just dead matter. So it might seem a little weird for me to say this, but our bodies are always dead. If we think about this closely, yeah. unless we have a living force within our bodies, then our bodies are simply dead matter. Unless there is a driver within the car, the car won't start. So similarly, the spirit gives the matter life. The spirit gives the matter um, some form. The spirit gives the ma uh, makes the matter appear like it's living. So this body, it is already dead, but simply by the presence of my soul, I'm able to move it. I'm able to walk. I'm able to uh, do so many things because I am the body. So the, to understand the differences between spirit and matter, we can understand the definition of spirit and the definition of matter. So spirit is sat. It is eternal. We are eternal spirit souls, everlasting, because we are part of um, uh, energy. But matter is asat. The forms are ever changing. When we were discussing today, Amritananda and Prabhuji, you gave this beautiful term, suspended animation. So matter is like suspended animation. Sometimes, as Prabhuji mentioned, sometimes the material manifestation is brought out by Mahavishnu in one of his breaths and another time is taken back. So it simply, it comes and it goes. So that is, that is matter. Matter is ever changing. You can see our bodies. When we were little, we had a different form. As we grew older, there was a different form. So like that, our bodies are ever changing. Spirit is also chit. It's conscious. It has knowledge. It is ever knowing. Matter is achit, it's not conscious, and it's full of ignorance. We can see our bodies without any, without, like if we touched a dead body, if we poked a dead body, if we threw a dead body over, over the window, it would not feel anything. 
But if I simply pinched myself, I would immediately feel a reaction. But that reaction is because of the consciousness without, within me. So we understand that consciousness is life. Consciousness is the symptom of life. Consciousness brings about life. So the spirit is also ananda. It's ever blissful. Matter is near ananda. It is without bliss and it is prone to suffering. So these are the different uh, differences between spirit and matter. And although like we, we can say, we can say today, um, in, in regards to spirit is eternal. If uh, someone left their body today and it was in front of us, we say, oh, look, so-and-so is gone. So-and-so has left. But where have they left? Where have they left us? Why do we say that they are gone? We say that they are gone because the person who made that body appear alive has left our association. So we say they are gone for that reason. Oh, Kirabi is gone. Oh, they're gone. What can we do? Because simply the soul has left. So we think about it that way. And I think that has really given a sobering understanding for me, especially in these COVID months. This is uh, my take on this part. Mirtan and Prabhuji, do you have any other thoughts you'd like to add to this? Surbi, I'd like to now ask you a question and return the favor when you ask me to role play. All if right. You, you, so, so you are a senior or a, a sophomore, or you're a college person, right? Mm -hmm. So you have some amount of years experience. So if you go as far as possible, think about as far back your memory can take, would you be willing to share that experience? Hmm, yes, let me think. Um, as far back, okay? Like, as far back. As far back. Which could probably say your first memory. My first memory. Um, let me think. Um, and it's, I feel like it's also getting conglomerated by other memories and pictures I've seen of myself when I was little. So I, I think that it would be when I was about three years old, I think. That is the earliest memory I have. And what were you doing? What was that memory I, about? I was in a white flower skirt and I was playing with my Barbie dolls <laughs> and I used to comb their hair and I think my dad took a picture of me like that. That is my oldest memory. So if you close your eyes, you could actually relive that experience. I can, yes, I, I feel like I am like, it, with her hair and I'm combing the Barbie doll's hair. I can I can totally imagine. Okay. So little Surbi as a three-year-old, probably in pigtails, and now a young Surbi in college, the body is completely different. The body is completely different. Completely so different. Hmm. Correct, it's completely different. Yes. So who's that person who's remembering? Wow, who is that person who's remembering? Who's remembering? Because everything, your cells, your brain cells, your skin cells, everything has changed. Yes, everything has changed. So who am I? Am I this body? I, I don't think, I think I am the one remembering. The, the person who had those experiences is remembering, not the person who, who's, who, who was in the experience. I am, I am the one, I am the one who, who had the experience and is continuing to have an experiences. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. So you're done, you want to add anything more? Um, not, I don't, I think this is enough for this slide. So when Surbi was talking about that matter, very quickly, you know, there are basically 24 main categories. So the first one is known as Pradhan, they call it the unmanifest, so you can understand it as the mode of goodness, passion, and ignorance, and this is the all-compensing. 
with matter, wherever there is the matter, material, what we call material existing, there is a pradhan, mode of goodness, passion, and ignorance. And then it's a subtle elements okay these subtle elements are called the false ego there is something which is the ego ego is nothing but the sense of i am now factually if we know i am that's what we're trying to understand who i am false ego is a mistaken identity very simply put is when the soul actually starts identifying itself with the body when the soul identifies itself with the body, it is called the false ego. So there is a false ego, there is the intelligence, and then we have the mind. And then you have the cross elements that sort of be touched upon is ether. It's extremely fine. There is air, we can't see it, we can feel it. There is fire, we can see it, we can feel it. Then you have water, we can also feel it. We can see it, we can touch it, it has some form. Then there is the earth finally. Earth also has everything, including the smell, which is there. And then you have the sense objects, you know, sound, touch, sight, smell. These are the five senses. And then we have the knowledge acquiring senses. If you remember at the early on in the slide, we said through our senses. If you remember, you know, it's called the Pratyaksha Praman through these knowledge acquiring senses. So as you're giving this uh, presentation, if the bell rings, I will hear it and then I will know that, oh, there's someone at the door. So the knowledge, I got some indication through my ear. Similarly, skin, I, you see little children, especially toddlers, a major part of their learning is through taste. That's yeah. why they're putting stuff in their mouth. And you, have to, you need to keep your house childproof. You need to keep stuff away and all these chemicals locked and all, because that's how they're getting their knowledge through this taste. Okay, the tongue. That's it. And then we have the five working senses. Now, each of this corresponds, if you look at it, sound is with ether, you know, air is with touch, and the organ is the skin, fire, sight, eye. Fire is nothing but light. It has the light and heat component. So this is how it correlates. This is what the matter, when we talk about matter, you know, these are the uh, understanding that we should have. There is the cross body, okay? And then there is the subtle body and then encompassing it all is the pradhan mode of goodness passion or ignorance so this is where we are at Surbi, you could take this away of course so um pulling on to the conversation of matter um as Prabhuji so beautifully mentioned um every seven to ten years every single cell of our body is replaced by a new cell that's known by all kinds of science, scientific discoveries. Every single day, our white blood cells are totally changed. Every single week, our red blood cells are totally changed. Every two weeks, our skin cells are totally replaced. And every seven to 10 years, our entire body is totally replaced by a new, new body. So people may say, I am a totally different person at seven years old. I'm a totally different person at 14 years old. I'm a totally different person at 21. But is that true? When, when, we, when Prabhuji asked me this question, remember your oldest memory, that sense of I-ness, that I am Surabhi, that I am this person, I am the person with these memories, it remains. So is it fair to say that our body has totally changed that, that we are new people? Or is it more that we are the same person having an elongated experience? It's just the matter around us is having a renovation. The matter around us is having a, a new upgrade, like the iPhone, a new upgrade. The same thing, <laughs> just selling in different ways. So the sense of I-ness, it remains. So are we different people or have our bodies simply changed? So I want to bring this to all of you. Uh, please bring to your mind one memory. It doesn't have to be an old memory or a, or, a, or a very profound memory. It just can be a memory. And to keep it specific, a memory of a time where you were very, very happy. So um, I encourage all of you to just close your eyes and remember one time 
where you are very, very happy. You can imagine all of the, what did it smell like? What did it feel like? What were your emotions? What were you hearing? I know for me, that memory is um, getting recognition from a very senior Vaishnava that I was singing Narsima Arti very well when I was very young. And I remember everyone was eating prasadam. I could hear some of the people talking. And this, this, this Prabhuji, who I very much look up to, who told me, and I remember feeling very, very deeply happy, very profoundly uh, grateful for that experience. And still I'm able to remember that experience. So that, that is my experience. That, that I-ness, that I-ness is still there. It is simply that I am remembering something. From it. Nothing has changed. So in this, so the question is, are you that person? Or are you the one now? What changed and what did not? So for me and for all of us, we are still the same person throughout all of our experiences. But what changed? Our experience has changed. Our body is changing. Our thoughts are changing. Our minds are changing at every second. But simply, we are still the same person having the same experience. So we can think about it. All right. So I think this is what I have to say for this slide, that our i still remains. Thank you, Surbi. That was nice. So, you know, to recap what we spoke about, there is the soul, okay? So soul is nothing but a spiritual spark. You can also visualize the soul to be a spiritual spark. Okay, consciousness, Prabhupada said, is the symptom of the presence of a soul. So how do you know that something, as long as something is conscious, okay, means that the soul is there. Consciousness is an attribute of the soul. Then you have attachments. What are attachments? The soul is not inert, it is an active entity. And whenever something has active, it can feel, it can think, you know, and it has certain desires. So it creates all these attachments, it has attachments. The soul by nature is always in a service mode. It is serving, it is serving. We'll see a little bit more of that how, okay? So the attachments, what are the attachments are the subtle body of the mind, intelligence, ego. So attachment is a platform on which the soul connects with the material body. So attachment forms this platform as what Prabhupada has explained. And then on top of the subtle body, we have the cross body of you know what we can touch and feel and see and taste and smell. That is the cross body. Now, once the soul is embodied into this material, this matter, okay, that's when the soul with all its desires, thinking, feeling, willing, acting, that's when it happens. And then that's where we have is the activities. These activities are nothing. It's very simple. It's karma, we karma or a karma, right? Karma is a simple, even in laws of physics, we have every action has an equal and corresponding reaction. Karma is a deep, deep, deep science. You know, just explaining it in one or two sentences so that we have some understanding. But there are various categories of what happens. So, you know, it answers why good things happen to bad people and vice, vice versa. You know, uh, karma is not constrained by lifetimes. The soul is eternal. So several billions of lifetimes is nothing but a fraction of time in a moment of eternity. So what happens is karma is whatever the soul has done, it follows the soul. Now, some of them can get manifested here in this lifetime, and some of them gets manifested in some other lifetime, maybe in some other lifetime, we do not know. But karma is always attached. Now, what happens is karma is something which is impermanent, and soul is permanent. Correct. So this impermanence is following. So as long as soul is embodied in this matter that you see here, these concentric rings, as long as it is there in the subtle and gross body, you know, the karma is chasing it. Karma is chasing it. Karma is nothing but action or reaction. You do good actions, you have to, karma will come in form of the 
good benefits that you get. You have a bad uh, action, you'll get the bad reaction, correct? Now there is something called we karma and there's something called a karma. Understand this, the soul cannot remain still. It is all the time moving, it's all the time in motion, the soul. And you know, it is serving, it is doing things. It cannot remain still. They have tried to do experiments in the lab where you have the Buddhist monks who sit down in deep meditation and their waves, the mind. So right now, if we look at attached those probes, there'll be a lot of activity in our brain. They can all scramble. A lot of activity will be there. Meditation, when you do, it kind of smoothens it. It goes slow, like, you know, slowly undulating with very large frequency. That's what happens. So they can bring it down but it can never be closed. And in Gita also it says, you know, you can't, you can't just become void. It can't. You cannot think of nothing. Because even nothing is something if you're trying to think about it. So all the time the soul is active. And as long as there's activity, there is this karma. So for normal things, it is V karma is something which is extremely heinous. Extremely heinous activities are called vikarma and the reaction is uh, phenomenal, extreme. And finally, there is a karma. A karma is a very beautiful concept that in spite of doing action, there is no reaction. Think about it. In spite of doing actions, there is no reaction. So the soul is active by nature. It cannot remain inactive. Soul doesn't die. The body may become inactive. Soul doesn't die, it will move on to another body. So that is called a karma. Now, any activity per se is neither karmic or a karmic. Okay? The intent behind it decides. To give you a very small example is if you light a matchstick. Now, the matchstick that is lit could be used to light an agar bhakti and offer it to the deities that activity becomes lighting the match becomes a karmic. Now that same match which I light and I smoke a cigarette for my pleasure because when that nicotine goes in, it gives me a rush. If it is for my pleasure, that becomes karmic. There is action reaction for that. If I the same thing I use it to do the agarbhati, the exact same act, it becomes a karmic. So karma or a karma is dependent on for intent, for whom, whose pleasure it is being done. And every little act that we perform, from blinking your eyes, from taking a breath. You know, I think I saw Mother Gail on the conference. Mother Gail many years ago gave a beautiful example. And she said that in the morning when she gets up and brushes her teeth, a mundane thing that we've been doing since we were little children, day in and day out, you know, you brush your teeth. Brushing the teeth becomes an act of devotional service because her consciousness is that I'm cleaning my mouth so that I have to go and chant Japa. Krishna will be coming on my tongue and I need to have a clean space. So literally every act that we do can become a karmic and a karma is what removes us out from the circle of birth and death. So keep this in mind about the soul, attachment, subtle body and the activities. Here you go, Surbhi. Thank you, Surbhi. Thank you. Um, just as Prabhuji was mentioning, the different ways to uh, understand the body, mind and soul, as well as karma, we can see whatever Prabhuji explained in this pictorial representation of uh, a chariot. And the chariot, this is given in the Bhagavad Gita, the chariot uh, represents the body. So our body, our, whatever we have, our body is represented by this chariot. The horses represent the senses. The, the horses, you know, they tend to go everywhere in every which way direction. That, that is represented by the senses because they run wild without control. And what is that control? That control mechanism is the mind, the reins. The reins of the mind can keep the horse or they can let go of the horse. But without anyone holding on to the reins, 
the horses can run free. So we need someone to hold on to those reins. Then there comes the charioteer. So our charioteer holding on to the reins of the mind is the intelligence. And this intelligence, it is also, a, it's, it's a God-given gift to us. It is called the faculty of our discrimination. And so we can hold on to the, our mind when it wants to run free, when the horses want to run free. Then sitting at the back, you'll see in the white with its mouth wide open, it is the passenger. The passenger is the soul, it is us. So we can understand that we are simply the witness. We are simply seeing whatever is happening outside. We are simply on a ride. And who is taking our ride? The intelligence and these horses. But, we, but the intelligence is directed by the soul. So we have power in telling um, you go this way or this way. But when the intelligence is pure, spiritual and strong, then it, can cut, cut, then it can control the mind, it can control the reins, which in turn controls the senses or the horses. Just as a good driver controls the reins, just as a good driver controls the car, the overall purpose of the soul body arrangement can only be fulfilled if the senses are controlled. So un unless the horses are kept steady by the steady hand of the driver, the charioteer of the intelligence, then uh, there is no possibility for us to go anywhere, to do anything productive. When the intelligence is contaminated, on the other hand, and weak, the mind and senses, which are full of material desires and enjoyment, the mind is compared to a storehouse. And it is filled with all kinds of desires and memories and fantasies of what we want and what, what, what kind of revenge we want on someone else, what someone said to about us, what we will say to them, all kinds of things like that. When the intelligence is weak, then the, the horses can easily carry away the chariot of the body in a very dangerous and uncontrolled way. So we must nourish our intelligence. So what is the solution? We need to nourish our intelligence in such a way that we can make it so strong that we can guide it in different ways according to our will. Otherwise, it will go astray. So this knowledge is especially important and I can see how it applies to my own life as a college student because, you know, we're in quarantine right now and it's very easy to just to turn off, turn off your uh, video camera in classes and just go and watch YouTube during your class. It's very easy to do that. But when we nourish our intelligence with some spiritual knowledge, with the idea, as Prabhuji said, I don't have to go to work. I get to go to work. I don't have to study. I get to study. When we turn it into an opportunity and we exercise our intelligence, then we are able to, um, we are able to use our intelligence and control our senses. And only by controlling our senses can we have so much production, productivity in our life. So this is an especially important to me, and it's truly changed my life, the idea that we have a body-soul chariot, and we are the passengers. We can direct it only if our intelligence is capable enough. So, Buddy, do you have anything to add to what I have said? Lovely. That's it. Very well explained. Thanks, Surbi. If you're done, I could go to the next slide. I'm also trying to do a time check over here. I know uh, there's a little over 30, 35 minutes. So the other slides that we have to do, uh, we may try to, it may, I mean, there's most of it has been completed. The fundamentals uh, we have covered, you've covered it very well. So again, I apologize for the back and forth. It's my mistake. So here is what we spoke about, right? So we said the intelligence. We need to strengthen our intelligence, correct? How do we do that? The strengthening of the intelligence. So there are, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says that there are many, uh, there are many avenues of how you could do that. So first of all, we need to have something called God realization. Now, please understand God is a title, like CEO. Currently, the CEO of Amazon is Jeff Bezos, correct? CEO of Amazon, right? What the CEO does is, CEO is nothing but the person with the highest authority or power in the company 
holds the title called CEO, Chief Executive Officer. Similarly, this supreme person with the ultimate authority and power, ultimate authority and power in all existence holds the title called God. However, CEO and God, right? There's a person who holds the title. There is a person in our day-to-day, -day, we can understand, you know, I could be a manager, Surbi is a student, somebody is a father. These are all titles and de designations. And it is a person who holds this. Similarly, God is a title. God is actually a person with a personality. Okay. CEO has a name, Jeff Bezos. Correct. Probably Jeff Bezos may be having a middle name. I do not know what his middle name is. Maybe two names. And, you know, people who come from the Latin American country have really long names. They have their name, their grandfather's name, their grandmother's name. And, you know, it goes really long. But even then, that's limited. But here we have God who is unlimited. He has unlimited names, some of which we understand through the scriptures. And there are some which is even beyond our capacity. Correct. What are his few names? There is a name called Parthasarthi, the chariot driver on Kurukshetra of Arjuna. Right. There's Ranchod when he leaves the battlefield. There's Madana Mohana. There are so many Madasudana. There are so many, so many names. But the name which best describes him in totality is called Krishna. Just these two syllables. Just the two syllables, Krishna, defines the entire, the entire uh, paradigm of God, the person, Krishna, right? So there are different understanding that we have. So the first one is a very basic level, okay? It's a Brahman realization. So we call the energetic, correct? Now the energetic has an effulgence. So that is called the basic understanding. So by doing certain types of yoga, we get to the Brahman realization. We understand the effulgence of Krishna. Okay. That can be compared to the sunshine as an analogy. Higher than that is the Paramatma understanding, which is the Chit aspect, the omniscience. Okay. You meditate and it comes you get to know. So it is like you have sunshine and then the sun globe itself. That's what the Paramatma realization. You have to get into deep, deep, deep meditation and through knowledge, jnana. You are doing these meditation and then you're trying to understand. Both these processes are extremely difficult, especially in this condition where we are more and more materially attached. And if you can see in our own lifetimes, Soon I'm going to be 60 years old. And I remember the time my earliest memory was when I was two. And now from that time through toddler, through youth, you know, growing up, now middle age, through that time I can see what is called the degradation. We never had gun violence in our school. Never. Prosperity has gone phenomenally. Creature comforts of the body, phenomenal increase. However, the basic value and the core, if you look at it from the perspective of the soul, it is completely starved. Why? Because materialism, we are getting to be more and more identifying closely and tightly with the body. That is the root cause of all this. So in this condition to do, get, you know, even the Paramatma to do meditation is completely, it's almost impossible, right? The highest and incidentally, also the easiest form of God realization is Bhakti. Okay, Parmeshwara, Param Ishwara. Lord Brahma says, Ishwar Parama Krishna Satchitananda Vigraha Anadiradir Govinda Sarva Karana Karanam. So, this aspect, the person, Krishna, the person, Krishna is Ananda. It includes the omniscience aspect, it includes the sat aspect. So the person who knows Krishna has the full and complete realization of who God is. And the only process for that is Bhakti Yoga, which happens to be the simplest and the most 
the recommended, Krishna himself says, this is what you do and here's how you will realize me. So, so beautiful it is, the simplicity of it. Just by saying Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Just by saying this with deep affection, with deep love, the entire knowledge of all the Vedas and whatever there is to know will be revealed. So this is the realization of how we can come to God and our entire topic, what Prabhupada has done is he has simplified and said, here, here is Bhakti Yoga for you. This is what you do. So Surbi, you can now talk about the, sorry. Haribo. So now, uh, Prabhupada uh, and me, we will go into different experiential and influential proofs uh, and also scientific proofs about um, how we can prove the soul's existence. Um, so here we have two, two different stories that we hear from the Shastras. And basically the point is there are many near-death experiences people experience, many OBEs, out-of-body experiences people experiences, and also past life memories people experience. And these, these two we see, um, one is Jada Bharat, the story of Jada Bharat. Jada Bharat was um, a king who became a sage, but at the, at, at, at the time of his death, he remembered a sweet deer that he was taking care of. And in his next life, he took birth in the form of a deer. So the story, um, it shows how the, the soul is the missing link between the, uh, the first life and the second life. There is a past life memory that is um, transferred into Jada Bharat's uh, deer life in which he remembers, oh, I remembered a deer in the last moments of my life. If only I could have been attached to Krishna like that. And in, this is one Shastric example of a past life memory. Another example is Narada Muni. Narada Muni, he was in the Srimad Bhagavatam, he explains to his uh, disciple Vyasadeva that he was the son of a maidservant in his last life. And he, by the association of great Vaishnavas, he was able to get the body, the spiritual body of Narada Muni. So this is also another example of past life memories that our, whatever our consciousness is in this life, we are simply building it and building it and creating our next life. That a, a, a very famous saying is you are what you eat and here we see you are whatever you take in whatever for for Jara Bharat it is the deer for Narad Muni it was the association of the devotees so whatever life we are creating now maybe we do not see results immediately but we will see results eventually and even as as we see here even through next lives so this is all I have to say on this we can move to the next So this is self-explanatory, you know, the uh, benchmarking at Atma with Paramatma and Atma with Krishna. So this is what we can, oh yeah, here you see the dimensions of the soul is given in the scriptures as it's one ten thousand part, the tip of a hair. So Surbhi and I were discussing this point. Um, you know, if Atma is one ten thousand tip, now the human hair approximately is 0.04 to 0 0.06. So see about 0 0.05 uh, mm uh, millimeters. Uh, one ten thousandth of it would make it 10 to the power of minus uh, 6, correct? So you have microscopes, electron microscope, power microscopes, which has actually taken even picture of an electron, which is like goes into angstrom uh, units. So how is it that we cannot detect the presence of the soul? Would anyone like to feel this? Or why go so small? Paramatma is approximately the size of a thumb. Thumb is definitely that we can see with our eyes. Hare, Hare Krishna Prabhu. Yes, sir. Spirit, uh, uh, spirit, uh, soul is spiritual. That's why microscope, material microscope cannot find it. 
excellent because as we said matter correct so the very simple explanation is can i see with my ears no i cannot see with my ears so it's something like trying to use your ears to see something they're totally incompatible so even if there is a spiritual mountain giriraj actually in vrindavan there is govardhan giriraj ji is there but we think of it as mud you know all a small little hillock that consciousness is not there the consciousness and other is that there is the incompatibility you cannot use matter to go through as we discussed this right pratyaksha so this is the atma parmatma and atma and uh, krishna another point here is free will it's a very important aspect free will is nothing but that ability to make a choice ye or nay that's a free will even that free will is not ours it's given by krishna something like a rental car we go to a rental agency and we take a car that car isn't ours we're just using it over here so free will is bestowed it's a gift given by krishna and there's a reason for it that can come on later on during the uh, other uh, days so we sorry goku ji thank you so much so here we are also discussing um the difference between us and god and in in chapter 2 rupa refer, references um a beautiful passage from the katha upanishad that i wanted to share which shows the relationship between the paramatma as prabhuji de- described and the atma which is us so it is explained that our heart it is compared to a like tree with beautiful fruits and there are two birds on that tree one bird is us it is the atma and it is constantly eating the fruits the fruits of what the fruits of its actions so all of uh, our fall all of the fruits of our actions we are busy eating them then there's another bird on the side looking over at its friend busily eating the friend is the paramatma and it's just patiently waiting for its friend to turn around and just look at him and pay attention to him so krishna is compared to that he is simply waiting behind the curtain of ignorance and he's waiting for us to show up and uh, take it take his advice so that's what arjuna does in the bhagavad gita so this is basically what is the difference between us and uh, god we are not god but we are gods we are krishnas we are krishna's apostrophe <laughs> all right thank you so now finally we come to you know show me does soul exist so whatever you're saying seems to make sense or at least it's reasonable correct so show me if you remember that jerry maguire movie show me the money that agent sport agent is telling the uh, sports star i have this so he keeps saying show me the money show me the money so here's where the proof positive is how can we show that the soul exists okay do things exist beyond our gross senses and knowledge yes so how do we know whether it exists or no it's beyond our perception there are so many things in our day to day life can you see mars no but you have stuff by which you can see correct through discovery of cause and effect okay there are two branches if you remember material science and the spiritual science so material science you already have established has the limitation spiritual science is perfection now currently perfection when we say the statement spiritual science is a perfection is right now it is only a paradigm until and unless it is put into practice realization that's when you actually know it is perfection otherwise it is just conceptual it has to be put into practice to realize what this perfection means so spiritual is perfection okay can matter be used to understand spirit the gentleman i forget who the prabhu is it was just a telephone number so that prabhu said no you cannot use matter to understand it is completely incompatible not possible impossible so because it isn't conscious or perfect you could take a picture 
you know, which is several uh, hundreds and thousands of millions of miles away like Mars. But the camera cannot interpret that picture like how Madhupati Prabhu showed in a slide yesterday. There needs to be some intelligence, some consciousness to look at it and try and figure out what it is. Right? So then how do we know with all this, how do we know that the spirit exists? Now, there are a couple of ways like hints and glimpses that we can make a reasonable explanation of how that exists from the scriptures. And very important what Madhupati Prabhu said yesterday, through the medium of grace, these two things are required. Correct? If you remember the example of Mother Yashoda tying uh, this one, uh, Bal Gopal, the endeavor and the uh, grace, two aspects are required over here. What we are right now doing is just knowledge, intellectual. But when it's actually put into practice, there is realization. And then this matter, which is just a paradigm, becomes a reality. Taste of the pudding is an eating. Old saying, true there for anything, true even here for the spiritual aspect. Otherwise, it is just a knowledge, conceptual. Okay, so here's an experiential proof. So we touched upon this like an automobile, a car, wheels to move, legs to move, on to produce sound, mouth to speak. Okay, engine to move and control, brain to move and control. Like Surbhi said, car doesn't move on its own. You even have autonomous cars. So someone will say, well, you know, this Google has this autonomous car. And in fact, actually, Budweiser, the guys who make this uh, beer, they had this huge semi-trailer. They did a run uh, about 300 or 400 miles on the freeway. Absolutely no driver. There was no human being in the cab. And it took a full load from point A to point B. Now you may say, well, the car is functioning. There is no human being to function it. No, there is a human being to function it. There was the guy, the engineer, and the teams who actually with their intelligence designed it to move on its own, to automate it. The war which is going on in Afghanistan, there is a person, soldier sitting in Colorado operating a drone which is 20, 30,000 miles high up and bombing some terrorists outlet. There is no one in the drone. But there is a person who is controlling that thing. So that intelligence. So similarly, we have this human body and the analogy is made to a machine, the car. Human body, in fact, is called the yantra machine. Who is operating this human body? Okay, so other way to look at it is through common sense. So we touched upon this body has changed. I have remained the same. There is this intuitive feeling. I am hungry. This is my hand. Who is the I? Who is the me? Right? Then there is consciousness, that awareness, the sense of awareness. Okay, patients under anesthesia. Okay, they though they have their uh, external, the conscious active function is shut down, they're still having this awareness. There is a devotee who used to come to our center, Mauricio Prabhu from Colombia. He was telling a story. He was shot bank robbery four times in his stomach or three times. He showed those bullet wounds and it was touch and go. He was in the hospital. They did surgery. Now his brother happens to be a Hare Krishna devotee. So his brother would sit there, you know, hours on end and just chant Japa. He would just chant the Maha Mantra. This guy is totally in coma. And after several weeks, when he came back to regular consciousness, he could remember that his brother had been chanting. And that's how he took on to Krishna consciousness. So this consciousness that we have, externally it may seem to be shut down, but the consciousness is always alert, right? Then we have the near-death experience and the out-of-body experiences. There was this lady called Pam Reynolds who had a, uh, these all medical, huh? uh, who had a deadly brain aneurysm. And then the doctor said, this is the high-risk operation. We have to clinically make you dead. There's something called clinical death, where you flatline. All functions, brain function ceases, heart, everything ceases. She flatlined and then they opened up her skull and then they did whatever the uh, surgery was to be done. And then they put her back together and she came, they started, jolted her and brought her back. And then she clinically dead, flatlined. You know, you see this in movies and all that. Flatlined patient was able to describe in pretty detail of what was happening. 
So who's the person who's observing if it's just a brain which controls everything, sight, tongue, speech, smell, everything? Who was that person that had flatline? So this gives us an example of these near death and the out of body experiences. So I think we we'll now need to rush and bring it to a close. Surbi, so if you can. Yes. So um, thank you so much, Ruji, for that wonderful description of Pam Reynolds. I never heard that story. So here the question is, we've heard so many proof, proofs that we are not the body, we are the soul. We've been hearing that since childhood. Since Sunday school time, I've been hearing, we are not the body, we are the soul. Say Nittai Gora Haribo. I've been hearing yeah. that since childhood. But wh what, did, what does that really look like? We know that. We know that intellectually. But what does that really mean? Can anyone prove that we are not the body, we are the soul? So let's try in a, a small experiment. Are there any children in the audience today? Are there any children? Well, I am my mother's child. If you would take a few minutes. Haribo. Is there someone there? I see someone there. Yes, Osha's here. Oh, it looks like there's a little bit of echo. Um, can you maybe turn on your camera? Um, Haribo. It's so good to see you. Um, so we want to, I want to do a small experiment with both of you. Um, so I'm going to ask you a few questions, all right? Let's spotlight, uh, let's, can we spotlight Akhilesh Tiwari Prabhuji's Zoom? So I'm going to ask you guys a few questions um, and you just have to point. It's basically just, I'll tell you um, something like, where is your head and you'll just point, okay? Where your head is and things like that, all right? So let's get started. Okay, so where is your head? Okay, where are your eyes? Where's your nose? Okay, where's your neck? Your stomach? Okay, where's your, <laughs> where are your shoulders? Okay, now where's your mouth? Okay, now you can, where are your ears? Okay, now where are you? <laughs> I see you hesitated for a minute. So you're here, you're here right now? All right. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, you guys, you did, guys did a perfect job. So you guys are here right now, right? You're not, you're not your ears, you're not your eyes, you're just here right now. Mm -hmm. So here through this experience of, um, thank you both of, both of you for helping us. So here through this experience, mm -hmm. we see that we Haribo. are here. Haribo, thank you guys. So here through this experience, we see that we are not the ears, we are not the body. It's not eye, ears, eye. It was the two children, they were kept on pointing at themselves. As we see Osha and his little sister, they kept on pointing to themselves. So we understand from this experiment that we see the little hesitation in Osha and his sister when I asked, where are you? So the question, where are you? It doesn't mean that we point at like our hands or something like that. It means the person who is doing the pointing. So it, it's the witness. It is Osha and his little sister. It is the witness, the one who is pointing. So thank you, both of you, for uh, showing us such an important topic in today's discussion and approving that. So thank you both. Let's move on to the next. This is another scientific experiment. There is a doctor, Wilder Penfield. Of course, he has passed away and a genius on the brain surgery, especially uh, a Canadian, uh, especially related to epilepsy. So he set out to prove that consciousness and soul doesn't exist. There's no such spiritual element. It's just matter. This is what his hypothesis was, and this is what he set out to prove with experiment. Okay, So he set up a system to monitor brain activity. And then he tells the patient to, you know, the patient's brains were opened. And then he had set these probes and highly technical. And he told the patient, and the patient is conscious, but he has a blindfold. And he tells the patient, raise your arm. So the patient raised his arm and he says, okay, put it back down now. He put it back down. So he says, what did you do? So he says, I raised my arm and then I put it back down again. So then what he did is, after that, when he saw the patient raising his arm, he saw one part of the brain which got activated with the electrical impulses. 
Uh, I forget what that area of the brain is called. Anyway, that's not important. So what the doctor does is the doctor activates that brain area uh, manually. He manipulates it and sends electrical impulses to that area. And then the hand just goes up, you know, and it comes down again. So through external manipulation, he raises the patient's arm and puts it down. Then he asks the patient, what did you do? He says, nothing. So he says, did you raise your arm? He says, no, I didn't raise my arm. So now if you look at this, in both cases, the brain was involved in raising the arm. It got a stimuli, electrical stimuli, it raised it. But then the question is, who acted the way, activated the brain to raise the arm when he told him? From where did that electrical impulse come? Now, of course, the doctor sent an electrical impulse from outside, something. Uh, he put that and the arm went up. But when the doctor gave the command, raise your arm, where did that electrical impulse? Who told? What, what happened? Where did that stimuli come from? So this shows that there is something. And finally, his conclusion is the brain is like a computer that is programmed by something outside of itself. So this is one indication that the proof of soul, but again, it is still theoretical. Until and unless we do not put it into practice, whatever knowledge that we get, if it isn't put into practice, is nothing but useless information cluttering the brain, which some new information will come and throw it out. Surabhi? So Thank you, Prabhuji. So here we have a little bit of a story time um, uh, that displays um, how we have this tendency to polish the cage. So this story follows, there is a woman who owns a bird cage and a beautiful, beautiful canary bird who sings beautiful melodious songs. But this lady is so attracted to the golden cage in which she has put her beautiful canary bird. So every day she's cleaning very intricately the, all the edges and sides, the back, the top, the front, the every single side, she is cleaning of that bird cage. Whenever the bird is eating, she's cleaning. Whenever the bird is leaving, she's cleaning. She's always cleaning the bird cage, but she forgets to feed the bird inside. So after a while, the canary bird is singing and singing, but after a few days, a few months of not getting food, the canary bird's song, it stops. And finally, the canary bird passes away. A similar thing happens with us. We are like a bird in a cage. This body is like a cage. And we are like the bird inside. But we are often very busy in polishing the cage. It, I, I saw this ad on YouTube today, 10 beauty tips to look 10 years younger. And these ads uh, are everywhere in this world. We're always trying to clean the body. We're trying to put on nice clothes, nice makeup, nice things to look our best on the outside. But what about the inside? So here, Bhakti Rasamrita Swami Maharaj, he uses the term, the cage polishing civilization. So instead of turning our attention externally, we can turn our attention internally. And Surabhi will tell us about that if in a few minutes. Thank you, Surabhi. So what does the Shastra say? Okay, you are the soul, correct? And it is the infinitesimal part of the infinite whole. It is eternal. Bhagavad Gita, actually chapter two, if you read, is phenomenal. Uh, Krishna Namanan Prabhu was saying yesterday, right? Just the introduction of Bhagavad Gita, it will open the eyes to so many things, so many. So chapter two, you know, the soul, the science of the soul is encapsulated in chapter two. It is eternal. Eternal means it can't be, it's forever. Because eternal, it's indestructible. You can't cut it, fire can't cut it. Uh, air can't dry, fire can't burn it, air can't dry it, sword can't cut it, water can't wet it, indestructible. It's an individual. 
when we spoke earlier, you can think of the analogy of the fire and the spark. Krishna is the fire, this is the spark. But it's an individual consciousness is there. It changes material body. Death is nothing but a change of material body. We feel sad. People who are left behind are felt, feel sad when a loved one passes away. Because whatever was our medium of exchange, the relationship of love, so many things, correct? The body was the medium in which it used to happen. And now that the body is no longer there, that is what hurts. The person has moved on. The soul has moved on. Correct? So change of material body is death. It is as natural as birth. So Krishna says, we don't lament. A person who has the realization will not lament for changing of the material body. Something like, I'm wearing a kurta. When I go to sleep, I'll wear my night suit. I take this off and I wear a night suit. When I'm wearing my night suit, I don't feel sad that, oh, you know, now I'm not wearing my kurta. So change of material bodies is death. And finally, it is inconceivable. It is invisible, it is immutable. Immutable means it can't be changed. You can't add or you can't subtract from it. It remains as is. And inconceivable is that what we're trying to understand is something which can't be described by words. Bhagavad Gita Krishna tells, it comes down in the disciplic succession, we understand it. Prabhupada gave us Bhagavad Gita as it is. We read it, it starts opening up our mind. But it's beyond our concept, this concept of what is the soul. And again, I stress on it, the only way, the only way to know that you're not the body, you're the soul, is through practice. And that practice is called sadhana. So these are the various uh, texts. You know, beautifully it has been explained. From youth to old age, similarly, the soul passes into another body at death. Correct? Happiness and distress. It's like appearance of winter and summer. From sense perception, we should learn to tolerate them without being uh, disturbed. Okay? Person who is, is towards liberation. Those who are the seers of the truth have concluded that the non-existence, there is no endurance, and of the eternal soul, there is no change. This they have concluded after studying the nature of birth. That which pervades the entire body is indestructible. Okay? Immeasurable. Eternal living entity. Okay? It's sure to come to an end, therefore, fight. This is, of course, you know the story of the Mahabharata and why Krishna spoke. Okay? He is giving Arjuna the reasons as to why he should do his dharma. Okay? We just spoke about this garment. Can't be cut into pieces by weapon, can't be burned by fire, can't be withered by wind. Okay? Unbreakable, insoluble. Okay. Everlasting, unchangeable, immovable, eternally the same. It is invisible, inconceivable, immutable. Okay. One who has taken birth is sure to die. Birth is nothing but the soul activating matter. That's all there is. It activates that matter. It gets manifested for some time in the body. Anyone who takes birth will grow old. That's how material is. There'll be disease. And then finally, there'll be death. This is a very nice text. Some look on the soul as amazing. Some describe him as amazing. And some hear of him as amazing. While others, even after hearing about him, cannot understand him at all. We may just by this little thing, there could be fascination. You know, such a microscopic little thing yeah. can fly this aeroplane, hundreds and tons of weight. It's manipulating so many things we are doing, so many inventions, so many. I mean, it's fantastic what mankind and humanity is looking at. You look at a little bird's nest, the tail of uh, tailor bird's nest. You look at the uh, hummingbird when she's slapping her, her wings at what frequency there is. That same tiny little spark 
what all things it is capable of. It's truly amazing. All we need to be is a little mindful. Like I gave you the example of a tree, just a little mindful. It opens up a whole new world around us that we so far couldn't see. But even then, the understanding of that is pretty much, you know, if you're looking from an intellect point, I'll come back to this, it has to go into sadhana. Otherwise, these are nice philosophical topics. And in Hindi, there's a saying, Rat gai, baat gai. Once the night has passed, the topic also has passed. Okay. I think we can slide okay. into it. So that thought brings us here. What is our natural condition or are we conditioned unnaturally? So we are the soul we understood, correct? You have the material world, which is temporary, full of misery. There's an unnatural. There's this in incompatibility as that Prabhu uh, mentioned. And this incompatibility, the conditioning, we're trapped in the cycle of birth, old age, disease, death. You remember what we spoke about earlier, karma? That's what this conditioning is. But we're so used to it. The misidentity, we think that I am the body, I am the body, I am the body. Now here's the soul, permanent blissful entity, connected with another permanent blissful entity, right? That is a natural condition. Jivera Swarupa Hoy, Krishnera Nitya Das. The eternal position, constitutional position of a soul is service, and service with whom part. Part is meant to serve the whole. When it is serving the whole, it has value. When it is not serving the whole, it is, you know, garbage to say. Like this hand of mine makes sense as long as it's connected to the body. But the moment this hand is cut and put away, it will just rot and it's useless, of no use. What can I do with that hand? So I'm not the body, I'm the soul. There is what we are talking about, the satnas, to put it into practice. First step is the knowledge. Who am I? Who is God? That's what we attempted, Surabhi and I, to cover today. I hope it has been fruitful for you. Then there is realization. Realization is the practical application of knowledge. It removes confusion. And on this part of sadhana, it makes you into a steady progress. Then you have detachment. What happens is currently, you remember that attachment, and on top of that, the uh, subtle body is sitting, the soul and the attachment. Attachment is a platform. So instead of having these material attachments, instead of lighting matchsticks to smoke cigarettes and give us sense pleasure, and it's not just cigarette incidentally, it's even the food that we eat, the air that we are breathing. When you go out for a walk, we are killing hundreds and thousands of little, little, little insects. Mm. So everything that we're doing is kind of sinful. Anything that we're doing for our pleasure is trapping us in the cycle of birth and death through karma. Okay, but once we have knowledge, once we have realization, we get detachment. And what detachment does is it elevates our consciousness. It improves our mindfulness. Instead of just being I, me, myself, mine, okay, it becomes more holistic. That's what happens with the uh, detachment. And finally, at this stage, you get the result. The result is Krishna Prem. End of the day, every living entity is to love and be loved to love Krishna and Krishna's. You cannot be loving Krishna and not loving whatever is Krishna's. Mm -hmm. Impossible. There is no, love is not selective. Love is all encompassing. That's what love is about. So that is the result. Now, how do you go about doing this? This is what we know. This is the meat and bones and substance. So whatever that we have talked about today, to get the realization, it's called sadhana in uh, Sanskrit. And, you know, in our normal terms, there are, you must have heard this term called the best practices from knowledge to result, how to go about doing that. Now, there are certain benchmarks. There's the Guru Sadhu Shastra. So what they say, correct? They are the seers of the truth, not just anyone and everyone. Do this, do that, and you'll get this, you'll get that. No, Guru Sadhu Shastra. And then there is a component of the grace called Kripa or mercy. So these two components, you look at it as association. Now, I'll speak a little bit about this uh, uh, thing about the association, okay? What is the significance of association? Association gives us inspiration, it gives us encouragement, it gives us clarification, it gives us support. 
I'll give you a very small example. When you're in the association, if you want to become a drunkard, you don't have to go to a school or a university. How do I become an alcoholic? You just sit in the company of alcoholics, you'll automatically become an alcoholic. Similarly, if you are in the company of those on the path of bhakti yoga, you know the bhaks, you'll become, incidentally, bhakt is currently a very political word in uh, in the Indian subcontinent, and there is for and against. I don't mean that bhakt, okay? What I mean is a spiritual, a spiritualist, if you're sitting with him, a transcendentalist, if you're in that company, automatically you imbibe their character and their qualities. I'll give you examples. You know, when you look through their speech, through their behavior, our dear Daipakas Prabhu, he lost his dad a couple of days ago. He did all the arrangements in the night. Everything was done, and next day later on was the funeral. What did Jai Prakash do? This Prabhu, every morning, literally every morning, this Prabhu gets up, no matter what, and he attends Mangal Arti at 4 o'clock in the temple. So he gets up at his home, has a shower, goes in a clean consciousness, goes to the temple, does the worship. And that's how he starts his day. He's been doing this for years, Jai Prakash, correct? Now he's had such a sad event in his life, a major event. But... In the morning, he was there for Bhagavatam class. Mm. That's example. He didn't tell anyone anything. Later on, Madhupati Prabhu announced that we have this sad news in our congregation. But that is what is Sangha. If you are in Sangha, you look at someone and you get inspired by their behavior. I'll give you another example. In scriptures, we read Gaur Kishor Das Babaji, you know, to do his sadhana of chanting. Everyone would come and disturb him. Oh, give me blessing, give me blessing, give me blessings. And they only wanted material blessing. My business should go well. I should get a daughter, my son, uh, uh, good wife, all the nonsense. So Gaur Kishore Das Babaji would go and sit near a public lavatory. You know, and public lavatories in India are not clean. They are smelly, dirty places. Okay. He used to go and sit next to the public lavatory because nobody would want to come there. They would just finish their job and run, rush out. He used to sit there and do his japa. Now that was his dedication to his service of japa. Now Gaur Kishore Das Babaji is in... Uh, um, um, three, four generations ahead, correct? Now, in our generation and our experience, most of you know Govinda Nandani Mataji. Govinda Nandani Mataji, when we started ICNJ, it was at that first aid squad. There was no room. There were so many children full of energy. She used to sit literally in the passageway to go to the toilet. So on her left side would be the women's toilet. There's this passageway and a bunch of kids sitting there making, you know, having a ball. And on this side, they're all shoes because our culture is when you visit a temple, you remove your shoes out. So all the people's shoes, visitor's shoes used to be on her right side. Govinda Jandani sitting here. And then on that side is the laboratory. Now this, we can see it with our own eyes, our own example. This is an art. So what happens is when people do this, it inspires you. You know that nothing is impossible in this service. In spite of all the hardships, you could have very well said, well, I don't have any place to do my Sunday school. We don't have any place to do the Sunday school. And it's valid. Jai Prakash Prabhu has a solid reason. It's not that he ignored whatever he was supposed to do. He took care of all the arrangements. And it is understandable. I'm bereaved. I've lost my father. But in spite of, see, so this is what the importance of Sangha is. We have Krishnanam uh, Prabhu, we have Madhupati, we have uh, Simeshwar. These guys are the walking, talking, breathing encyclopedias of Shastra. They know so much. What I'm trying to present to you is not even a fraction. It's like, you know, a glowworm in front of the sun. So you have any question, you have any doubt, you can call them up, you can write them a WhatsApp message or something, and you'll get a response. A perfect response. And if he doesn't have a response, he says, okay, I'll find out from you know somebody else and get back to you. So this is what Sangha does. Then you have the next aspect is books that we were talking about, the Bhagavad Gita. Correct? What is books? They say the mind is like a parachute. It works best when it is open. Parachute closes, you'll hurtle down to earth on death. So mind is like a parachute, which works best when it is open. Books are the ripcord. Ripcord is that what you pull it and that's how the parachute opens. Books are the ripcord. So when we read books, okay, that's what happens. In fact, 
we came to krishna consciousness because of books i have a childhood friend who's a muslim his mother was a life member of the juhu temple and she had entire set of prabhupada's books lying in the showcase so i went there and i saw this the book i picked up was the krishna book you know the deluxe edition with beautiful pictures i didn't read anything and i brought it home and my mom loves to read and she read this and she wanted to meet shila prabhupada this is in the early 80s you know she didn't know and then some or the other you get busy with life and years later she was at a dentist in the waiting room there was another mata ji prem lila mata ji because of tilak she saw that tilak and she you know she saying hey what's that so she saying oh you know this is the tilak and she explained to her they came chatting and then she saying oh you know i have my nephew who has become who has joined iskon and uh, so she saying yeah yeah i know him he's in our temple and from there it started the journey of hari krishna so that's the importance of book someone was telling now we are having book distribution going on okay in the morning i attended this program of uh, isv the stuff that they're doing is phenomenal you know amazing and inconceivable of how they go about doing this so books are the basis books are the basis that knowledge and on basis of that knowledge we can put stuff into practice then the other is the significance of chanting oh wow i just love this chanting now i can share with you my personal experiences very quickly and we'll bring this to a close you know chanting means japa it can either be japa it can be kirtan madhav who started off the program a couple of hours ago madhav madhav is literally born in our congregation his father yogesh mother nitisha and uh, uh, yogesh's brother who has gone now, i think in dc or virginia and his son abhay uh, what a lovely family correct so madhav was singing that is called kirtanam where you do it with music melody and you know with a, then there is something called japa all you are doing is you are chanting this over and over again hari krishna hari krishna 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 hari 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 ram hari ram 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 hari hari i tell you the significance of japa in my personal life my father you know he has passed away severely diabetic one day when i came home from work in bombay uh because of hypoglycemia where the sugar level goes way down okay he lost control of his muscle muscles and all that his eyeballs popped out the tongue was hanging and it's a very frightening sight so i called a friend of mine he came with a jeep and you know jeep is open from behind we carried dad in a blanket and put him in the back and i was sitting with him and bombay is like crazy traffic and that was rush hour of office around 7 7:30 trying to get to the hospital and i was panicking i didn't know what's happening you know i could see death arriving and we had just started hari krishna at the chopati temple so i loudly started shouting at my father you know to death to make it go away you know there's a panic mode so i was loudly shouting hari krishna hari krishna krishna and you know cars and all others who have stopped at the traffic light or whatever everyone was looking around and wondering you know what's this crazy fellow doing shouted finally we reached the uh, hospital the clinic and people are running in and out and all and we waited for several hours and then late in the night 2 3 in the morning you know the doctor came and then he explained he saying see this is what has happened hypoglycemia now i forget what that number is either it is 60 is fatal if the sugar level comes down so i don't know what that exact number is but let's say it is 60 and my dad's number sugar level had gone down to 30 or 20 like way below what is the fatal level correct now i'm not saying is because of the strength of me shouting hare krishna correct there is a purpose because years later dad got connected with my guru maharaj radhanath swami and they had a very special relationship he's a musician so that's how it was arranged now we hear in the uh, chaitanya leela that when mahaprabhu went in the forest even the animals danced in kirtan now you say huh? how is it possible animals dance in kirtan so i was once long back sachi was a small kid 5 6 years old we went to throw the stale bread to the geese which is near one creek near our house so you know animals instinctive so i took this um um bread made it into pieces and threw it and all these geese came around, and geese are pretty aggressive fellows they came running and they started eating so i was i had my japa i said let's try so i started saying hare krishna hare krishna 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 hare 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 ram hare ram 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 and i increased my volume now it reached this bunch of geese the entire flock was busy fighting with each other and eating the bread over there one geese stopped eating and it turned and it looked at me and believe you me the eye contact it made 
it made an eye contact and i continued chanting and it continued listening attentively and sachi was throwing the uh, bread crumbs here and there and all the other geese were flocking and running here and there making a racket and i was chanting loudly to this geese and he was listening to uh, the maha mantra attentively now if you look at it an animal is instinctive i wasn't a threat i was standing far away because naturally when they're eating also they're very careful they look around to see it is so what is it that caused the soul to get attentive and then i think it was chandramouli maharaj or somebody in a bhakti vrikshas you know i'm talking about 20 years 18 years whatever so i asked you know this he's saying yes it is that's the spirit soul it has connected the spirit soul is spiritual and this is a transcendental spiritual sound and it has connected so that is what chanting is you know the power of uh, chanting and then finally we have diet you know this is a wonderful everyone has this diet that diet atkins diet no carb diet diet everything for health purpose again polishing the body like what surbi had mentioned over here but this diet what we're talking about is prasadam you know it's spiritualized it transforms consciousness not only will it make you healthy but it will transform the consciousness i'll give you two small stories and then we'll open it up for uh, q and a okay one more slide surbi has is there was you know i've been in the it business on the sales and business development end so you have to entertain customers and all that so there was this french guy working with philips and then he came here and then we went out for uh, lunch and uh, of course i'm you know vegetarian so this whole list no onion garlic and all that so we were sitting so i said what so he says that you know i used to be a vegetarian I said, "What?" He said, "Yeah, I was trying yoga and all. I was a vegetarian, and I felt clean inside, and I felt more energetic. I felt clean inside, and I felt more energetic." So I said, "Then why did you give up?" He said, "Oh, I was doing for yoga and uh, that stuff." But the significance is just even vegetarian food. If you eat, because you're not meant to be eating flesh. i'm not trying to make a political statement and i do not want to interfere with anyone's diet okay krishna doesn't interfere with free will i am nobody to tell anyone who to eat what to eat what not to eat okay but just if i look at it on basis of facts our mouth is that of a herbivore we have small canines flesh eating have long canines our saliva okay they have acidic because it breaks down meat the tiger is acidic his saliva it breaks down meat into its component whatever are the nutritions we have blunt to grind and chew which is suitable for vegetable our intestinal tracts are long the meat eating animal the carnivore his intestine is short why because meat decays more rapidly than uh, flesh and that's why we see when we have meat going inside us it remains for a long time and all these toxins are being released now these are all scientific okay these all scientific basis not it's proven so other thing what you're looking at is then there is vegetarianism which is better than meat eating but still vegetarianism also is the sin why is it a sin look at it this way the plant also has life the plant has as much a life to live as you do and i do so what what is it life depends on life you can't go hungry and die so krishna has said what to do in the bhagavad gita patram pushpam phalam toyam yo me bhaktya prayachati tad aham bhakti uparitam asthani prayatatmana what does that mean is just offer me a leaf flower water with love and devotion so whatever food we eat everything is krishna's remember that's what we spoke about if i just come to your house and steal something and go away without your permission i am hungry does that absolve me of that act karma so when i eat before eating i offer this to krishna it gets spiritualized that becomes a karma remember we spoke about mother gail also said brushing your teeth so the fundamental activity of eating can also be spiritualized so as long as we follow these four aspects the four pillars under the guidance of guru sadhu shastra we become eligible for kripa and then from knowledge realization detachment krishna prem 
that's that's for the transformation krishna nam was saying yesterday information to transformation that's the benchmark and trust me once you start becoming vegetarian once you start becoming krishna tarian if i can call it that it will know how revulsing the stuff that we had been putting in if you walk down shop right aisle where they have that meat you cannot even go down that that sight becomes abhorrent the smells become and you think oh my god this is what i used to eat once upon a time that's the transformation krishna nam prabhu was talking about so prabhu's mata ji's you know i am not the body i am the soul sing nithai gaura hari bol my dear surbi had said that this is what we used to do in sunday school and when aksh rohil and uh, anuj at dattatre prabhu's house we had a jam and with guitars and all these thing trumpet and all that and we made a rap song okay <laughs> and this is where it came from i am not the body i am the soul sing nithai gaura hari bol that's the kirtan sangha is the company we keep shravanam kirtanam prasadam so this prabhu mata ji is is so we would like to finish this off and bring it to a close i think that maybe we do some takeaways so we do some takeaways they're not so uh as as uh, knowledgeable as what you've experienced i think we can skip this it's just some something that's it so prabhu mata ji is as usual my bad bad habit of going over time i have hit 20 25 minutes over time my apologies i hope it was productive for you and as shri la prabhupad says satisfaction of the soul can only be obtained by questions and answers on the subject of krishna there is no question which is a stupid question usually when we are in a forum we always have that in our mind that i am asking the right question if i ask the right question will i look silly that i don't know even the basics the only silly question which is the one that is not asked but of course we are over time uh there is another forum through whatsapp you could put that over there any mistakes that i have made you know please forgive me and i'll close this by child is the father of man and what i mean by this is surbi in her age is like my daughter in fact she is one year younger than my daughter however in realizations i learn from her so surbi i'm extremely proud she should also be a sunday school child yes, so we had the service of you are my first guru you are my first shikshak no, guru no your mother and father are your I first guru you taught me i am so lucky to be doing this kind of presentation with my guru thank you madhupati no. for preparing me with my sunday school teacher i am really reliving all my childhood memories by being with you and i'm so lucky so thank you amrita nand prabhuji for being my shikshak thank you i learn so much from you thank you and thank you everybody thank you everybody shila prabhupad ki jai jai aur bhakt vrind ki jai himat bhagavad gita ki jai so let's take a question also okay prabhu if there is time yeah uh we normally go to 9:30 7 to 9 presentation and 9:30 we have six minutes oh i thought it was 7 to 9 okay so 7 to 9 presentation and 9 to 9:30 Also, I get into the question answer. If Sorry. No That's okay. Questions. That's okay. We can Go take ahead. questions. If no one has any questions, I have prepared a small, uh, small test to see how everyone has uh, done. It's uh, called a Kahoot. If if once we finish any questions, and if it goes past nine thirty, we can we can call it a day. Otherwise, we can do that. Whatever, whatever it is. Wow. Very good. <clears throat> Go ahead. What, what? Yes, please. If anyone has a question or a comment, realization, reflection, yes, corrections, please. <laughs> corrections. Prabhu, one reflection. Uh, Mataji, please go ahead. Uh, Hare Krishna, Prabhu Ji. This is Madhu speaking. Um, I'm 11 years old. Uh, okay. So I didn't fully hear the class. but i remember when you uh were talking about the senses and how are there the horses of um our like chariot and like our cha- like you use that type of um anal- uh, analogy so i was wondering uh, what's the difference between mind and intelligence this might not be relevant but um i would just 
wondering. So do you want to feel that or? I would, I just wanted to say what a wonderful question that you asked. I, I'm, I also had that question when I, when I was younger. So yeah, so my, my idea is, thank you mother for that beautiful question. Mind is in, in my, in, in my, um, in my, what I have read, the mind is like a storehouse of all these desires and memories. They're like the reins of the chariot. Do you see, do you see when Krishna, he, he's like pulling the chariot, he has these reins in his hand. That is like the mind. But who is holding that? Krishna is holding that. So yeah. Krishna, he's the intelligence. For, you know what I'm saying? So Krishna, he's the intelligence. He's holding on to that. But when we let that, let those reins go and we let our mind go, then our mind is going, oh, you know, I kind of want to play with Osh today. Oh, Tejas is bothering me today. Oh, mom is kind of doing a lot of art today. She's not paying attention. Our mind always goes like that. So it's like that. So when we focus our mind and when we hold on to the reins of the horses, then there is, then, then our mind is in control. Thank you for the beautiful question, Mother. Um, oh, okay. Um, thank you for answering. Would you like? Thank you. Would you like to add anything? No, that's all I want to ask. Thank you. Any other question or a comment, or anyone would like to add to this answer? Hari, well, this is Pritesh here. I have one question. Uh, would you be able to share this slide or recordings uh, that you are? Presenting that was a beautiful session. I appreciate that. Thank oh, you. Prabhu, Prabhu. Yes, Prabhu, this is available. You know, I think Simeshwar Prabhu, one of the devotees, has been recording this and it will be uploaded to the temple uh, media. So, both the uh, PowerPoint slide as well as the uh, audio and video recordings would be available tomorrow or day after, I guess. But yes, this entire six session. Uh, seminar would be available for later uh, reference and you know. Yeah, then you are. Incidentally, also, uh, we are having the six day session, but Monday to Friday, every morning, there is uh, a program, a Zoom program on the Srimad Bhagavatam. That is for about half an hour in the morning, 5 to 6 30 is Japa where everyone gets together and chants on the virtual call, followed by a half an hour pravachan on Srimad Bhagavatam. And then uh, it's going systematically. And then in the evening, Simeshwar Prabhu conducts the uh, um, Bhagavad Gita. That is from the evening 7 to 8 o'clock uh, every evening weekday. And then, of course, on Sundays and Saturdays, we are having uh, programs. So if it interests you, this topic of spirituality and, you know, topics of sadhana and so many things, uh, in addition to these six days, I'm putting it out there, there are these other programs available. Also, uh, you know, for there are quite a few people on the call. And I'm sure if you're having the Bhagavad Gita, you know, please read it. Please read it every day. Uh, if not, you can also ask for copies. You know, your Madhupati Prabhu is here and Krishna Nam Prabhu and Simeshwar and so many others. Uh, you want to gift it. This is the month Gita is spoken on. Actually, next week on 25th, uh, Surbhi was telling me it's Christmas. And uh, what was it, Surbhi? Christmas and? Christ Christmas. 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 Krishna. 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 Huh? Christmas and? Uh, I don't remember. Yes, yeah, um, it was a nice riddle anyway. I'm an old man, I forgot. So yeah, Prabhu. Krishna must. Thank you. Huh? Krishna must. Krishna must. Krishna must. Thank you. It will be available. Thank you, everybody, for your time. Thank you. Yes. So, can we ask that question or over the time? Time is over right now. I understood. But we can we can talk later, maybe personally. Yeah, Madhupati Prabhu, if it's up to yeah, whatever. So, can can we ask? Okay, Prabhu. So, 
question Prabhu, this is related to time actually in material element or 24 elements the time is the one of the element in spiritual uh, uh, creation there is no time right but how the all the past time is happening they are uh, one by one there is no time no changes but what is that uh, changing that that past time is changing simultaneously happening or it is one by one serially happening what is that there is no time but what you time is change right yes so you're saying is what is there in the spiritual realm and the time as we know it in the material realm yeah, do yes, I understand time, your question time. correctly and what is the difference so krishna yes, says in material, in material there is time time is the element it is changing time and change here yeah, changing something here but in the spiritual creation there is no time no changing no change anything but despite that we see that past times is happening and it is changing the past time also right but not the same past time is happening but change not changing but serially it is changing that time something is there it is it is change it is it is showing that past time so can you explain a little bit maybe i am not clear about it. from what i understand it is first we need to understand krishna says in bhagavad gita time i am correct yeah. So time is also one of the attributes of Krishna. Now, as you correctly mentioned, time is a measure of change. So thing is all constantly changing. You know, whether it is one second or whether it is, and we can see the change has an effect. So time has an effect and time destroys everything. Everything, it destroys the body, it will destroy this building. Everything, everything with time eventually gets destroyed. So in the material world, time has its effect time is the cause and there is an effect however in the spiritual world because it is eternal correct time doesn't have an effect here we are under the jurisdiction of time no one can escape that in the material world in the spiritual world like you see krishna is as a newborn baby you know vasudev carried him across the uh, river and then he becomes a little baby and then he does this leela of uh, 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 the Damodar leela. Then he becomes a little bit bigger and he goes to the forest as a coward boy. Then he becomes 11, 12 year old boy and he fights with Kamsa and uh, he kills uh, Chanur, Mushtika, Balram and then he kills Kamsa. Then he grows a little bit bigger, he grows a little. Now if you see that in that sequence, time doesn't control Krishna, Krishna controls time. And time will yes. not necessarily have an effect unless it is willed. Now Krishna wants to have these relationships. He wants to have a relationship in the Madhurya Ras. He wants to have a relationship as a parent. So similarly, when there are different entities, entities take on that form or we know what is our Swarup, what, what is our... Uh, uh, what is our... Uh, in the spiritual world, all of us once upon a time were residents over there. I don't know, I could have been a stone. A stone is also spiritual. And you could have been one of the gopas. We don't know. Correct? So this process is revealed when it comes to the stage of Krishna uh, Prem. And then over there, the soul, okay, is the soul male or is the soul female? Soul is neither male or female. It takes on a gender or a form based on the proclivity with which it wants to serve Krishna. So there is someone who wants to engage in a Shantaras. There is someone who wants to be a Dasya. So someone who could be a parrot, Radharani's parrots in Vrindavan. Okay? And, you know, and all these entities are highly, highly self-realized. Currently, we are doing six days of self-realization. They are highly, highly self-realized souls. And time which we are looking over there, you know, one hour, two hours, three hours, one day, one month, ten years, etc. There is day and night which is happening over there, but unlike the day and night which is happening over here, the earth is rotating, there is the sun, there is the day and night. And every day brings us closer to our death. Every breath, actually, not death. Every breath that we are taking, we are not living, we are actually dying slowly. 
the body is dying slowly number of breaths is so in the spiritual world prabhu the effect of time isn't felt yes. and and another way to make it more interesting is these leelas are eternal so mahabharat happened 5000 years ago according to the time scale the human time scale on the material platform 5000 years ago but that same mahabharat as you and i are talking right now is happening in some part of the creation somewhere damodar leela is happening somewhere so my understanding uh, of course you know we have very exalted vaishnavas but this is just my little understanding of this concept of time and how it works in the spiritual ma- world and how it works over here thank, thank you prabhu thank you very much prabhu what is your name uh, this is nice uh, is my your... name is ashish 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 karuna das prabhu uh, jagannath das prabhu. thank you prabhu you ask very nice questions i only see your phone number but now i know thank you hari bol prabhu thank you prabhu hari bol prabhu so i had other question but later we will ask personally prabhu or i will ask krishna nanand prabhu or madhubati prabhu later yeah they are the let i call them the walking talking breathing encyclopedia okay prabhu i have myself learned a lot and i'm still learning from them Madhupati Prabhu, I hope my answer was okay. Or please correct it. No, it was pretty good. Thank you very much. Amrita Nanda Prabhu and Shurabi Sundarachal Mata Ji, it was a wonderful presentation. Quite absorbing. So let's thank them both with a loud Hari Bol. Hari Bol. Hari Bol. Hari Bol. Hari Bol. If you have more questions for them, they'll be available. Uh, <clears throat> uh, we have a WhatsApp group called Nityam Bhagavata Sevya. You can send us a note if you're not part of it and we will add you into that. And uh, we can join and ask questions in that and join if you want. Uh, our um, self-realization, uh, <clears throat> daily uh, sadhana program, 5 to 6.30 in the morning, japa meditation, and 6.30 to 7, Bhagavatam study, right? And in the evening, 7 to 8, Bhagavad Gita. So that's every day. <clears throat> this was the second day of the science of self-realization, the science of Bhagavad Gita six-day seminar. Yesterday was the introduction. Today was very nicely, who am I? Uh, the science of soul. Tomorrow, we will dive onto another topic, which is discussing Bhagavad Gita. Who is God? will be presented by Shimheshwar Prabhu and Gopi Kanta Prabhu from 7 to 9. 6.30 to 7 will be Kirtan. Like this week before the 7 to 9, we're doing Kirtan in memory of Dada. So 6.30 to 7 will be Kirtan and 7 to 9, another absorbing session on who is God. That's tomorrow. And then Tuesday, The fourth day, the topic would be, why do bad things happen to good people? The center theory of karma, presented by Govinda Nandani Mataji and Kalindi Mataji. And then <clears throat> on Wednesday, again, we'll have a presentation on What is yoga? The Hare Kishore Prabhu and Akhilesh Krishna Prabhu. And then summing it up, practical applications of Bhagavad Gita by Dev Kirandan Prabhu and Hema Jagannath Prabhu on Thursday from 7 to 9. So stay tuned for this wonderful 
six day session uh, by uh, local devotees. We are making our humble attempt uh, first time. <clears throat> so please pardon us if we have made any mistakes and if you have shared something which has helped you, uh, please stay in touch and uh, no, give us your association. From Thursday, <clears throat> from Friday is Gita Jayanti Day, December 25th, also Christmas or Krishna must. Um, and on Friday, uh, we'll have um, recitation of the entire Bhagavad Gita with Yagya in the temple with COVID time. It will be presented virtually uh, through a webinar. And Raj Gopal Prabhu has put together something and we'll be sharing the link soon uh, on our WhatsApp as well as through our database. This December 25th. December 26th, you all invited to join. Uh, <clears throat> it would be a Gita memorization, realization, and skit time from 5.30 p.m. And <clears throat> on this Zoom call, we will form teams and in the team, we'll set up ground rules of numbers. Some chapters will be given to each team from which uh, some of the members from that team can either uh, recite a verse, share the realization, perform a skit, and the team which wins the competition uh, of the team event will get some special prize, stay tuned. And then on Sunday, again, absorbing day of guitar recitation competition, uh, there will be Jeopardy on uh, um, Bhagavad Gita, a lot of wonderful events next Sunday, December 27. All right, Paul. So December 25th to 27th will be wonderful. Okay, thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Prabhu. Hare Krishna, Prabhu. Hare Bhav. Hare Bhav. Hare Bhav, Prabhu. Hare Bhav, Prabhu. Hare Bhav, Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Prabhu. 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 Okay. So, Vancha Kalpataru Bhascha, 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 Vancha I'm glad you liked it. How do I close? Uh, 